Last night was a little heavy for some, but uh, they are on their way in. But we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, the first session of the morning is going to deal with is ischemic heart disease. And um, uh, we'll have uh, 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 some wonderful speakers. Mark Ruel, who is the last speaker of the session, um, is in Canada and was not able to make it uh, for logistical reasons. And he sent his talk, a very important talk, on the updated guidelines for ischemic heart disease and the controversy that it has generated. Um, uh, he sent his talk, uh, um, uh, he pre-recorded it and sent it to us, so we'll play that. And then the, um, the panel discussion right after that, we've sent Mark a Zoom link so that he will, uh, he'll appear on the screen like <laughs> Big Brother and uh, <laughs> participate in the discussion. So I hope you all uh, enjoyed the dinner and the discussion last night. I thought it was, uh, it, it was uh, you know, um, uh, very uh, productive. It's, it's a very difficult subject, this, this business of how, how do you retrain yourself in minimally invasive cardiac surgery when you've already established yourself in practice or when you're in a training program where you don't have exposure to it. Uh, no, no, no easy solution, but uh, sort of a continuing discussion. We've, we've got a great day uh, ahead for you today. Uh, there's a few more people that are checking in today than there were yesterday. Um, and it's going to be split into ischemic heart disease and um, um, aortic valve disease. Now, we've deliberately not included TAVR in the... Um, in the talks this morning because there's a lot that you can get about TAVR elsewhere. You will be exposed to TAVR simulators up in the lab, uh, but there's plenty else to talk about uh, without needing to uh, go into TAVR. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So one, just one, one, one quick important, uh, like, note for today. I'm going to take a group picture in the, uh, during lunch time. So we'll have to go down the stairs. And this is the way we're planning to take the picture. So we want the faculty members to be down, and the attendees will be in the stairs. We'll move a little bit, like two steps forward, so we can cover everyone else. We'll take the first picture for all the attendees and the faculty, and then we'll do one picture for the faculty for the future. We'll make sure to send those pictures and some photos from the lab for you guys later on. We'll, we'll find a way to send it to everyone. So that's all. And uh, now I'll ask uh, Dr. Weiler to come up and uh, start uh, the, the first session of the day. I think we have a really exciting uh, session on CAP. Uh, sometimes people are not quite as excited about CAP than when they hear mitral or tricuspid. I think, in fairness, it's the most commonly performed procedure. And so I, I think we have some really great speakers this morning. And without further ado, I'll ask Steve Hoff to come up and talk about mixed CAP. Thank you, Ritz, um, Hesh, Kassam. Uh, wanted to uh, uh, Thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Um, on behalf of the faculty, I um, wanted to thank you for sharing this institution with us and giving us a little bit of insight into this practice. Um, thank you for sharing the team around you, um, you know, Cicely, Becca, the people in the lab. Um, it's been an interesting insight into um, this institution. Um, Sam wins the award for the most invited speaker, I think, at nine out of 11. Um, I think between Sloan and Fran and I, we're somewhere close there in the five to six range. But as I was, uh, as we were uh, enjoying last night and I was listening to the people around here and around you talk a little bit, 
it uh, made me reflect a little bit. So I'm going to spend just a minute talking about that because I think it's a really, really important part of this experience. Um, uh, I have known you for a long, long time, and uh, you remind me of someone that I've met a few times in the past. And last night made me reflect on that a little bit. Um, for someone who's at the top of their game, but you'd never know it because of the way they carry themselves, the way they treat people, their humility, almost self-deprecation, yet their enthusiastic desire to elevate the people around them, um, the way people are treated and the way that you put good people around you, the way that good people gravitate to you because of the way they're treated and that sort of thing. It reminds me of, of another person um, who I was lucky enough to meet um, a few years ago, and we uh, call him Mr. Palmer. So, enough of that. Let's talk about heart surgery. <laughs> um, these are my disclosures. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about um, uh, minimally invasive coronary surgery, and we talked about this a little bit in the lab yesterday with some of the participants, and we'll talk about it a lot more today. Um, some of the things that you learned yesterday about transitioning a practice toward minimal invasive valve surgery um, are equally applicable for coronary surgery. And while I think there's a little bit more of a potential staging for coronary surgery, um, you know, and I've discussed this with uh, corporate executives for a decade and a half maybe, um, and have had some differences of opinion. Some of these stages, I think, are shorter than others. Um, I still think that there is a natural progression of what I would call minimally invasive or minimal impact coronary surgery um, that we can provide. And obviously, um, uh, at least those of us with gray hair started on, in the day where we utilized the pump and the cross clamp on a regular basis. And in this country, that's still how 91% of coronary surgery gets done. Currently. But I believe there is a transition to this. And I tell people that are transitioning, for, for instance, from on-pump surgery to off-pump surgery, that the, the ability to go to a, uh, from an on-pump cross-clamp to an on-pump beating heart um, pump-assist model is the initial first transition. Um, then that transition to um, all off-pump surgery or primarily off-pump surgery is another important step. I believe there are certain skill sets that go along with that. Um, that can allow us to then move that to another level. The ability to operate on uh, with motion, the ability to operate with a not completely bloodless field, and then do it through a small hole or through a scope or with the robot um, are progressive steps of, techno of technological um, um, uh, issues, but also technical issues that um, are really important. And so as we talk about making this transition, and you learn more today from the, uh, our learned speakers about things like um, potentially um, moving towards single vessel um, uh, disease with uh, either direct access um, mixed cabbage that we'll talk about, endoscopic techniques, robotic techniques, then the natural progression of that would be toward managing multivessel disease in a similar fashion, whether that be direct access, endoscopic, robotic. Each of those, I believe, are additional iterations in technological and technical issues. So one of the concerns that I have about making those transitions is the penetrance of less invasive, less impactful coronary surgery in the United States. When we all started doing this 10 or 20 years ago, about 20% of patients did not get done that way. They didn't get done with the pump or with a cross clamp. And that penetrance of OPCAB has dramatically reduced. In 2021, in the STS database, it is 9% in the United States. And so um, one of the questions here is, are we a dying breed? And so I think um, the, the, one of the reasons that we appreciate your participation here is your desire to at least um, learn more about these techniques. So uh, for years, we've talked about this less invasive way of managing coronary disease as a minimally invasive approach. Um, this particular slide talks about um, single vessel disease, but in a sterile sparing, uh, with a sternal sparing incision, avoiding aortic manipulation of the pump um, with the hope 
that we're talking about an operation that's of equal quality, um, but with fewer adverse events, um, allowing faster mobilization and return to regular activities, um, which, as um, Sloan mentioned to you yesterday, I believe would be appealing in a value-based um, healthcare system. So I mentioned this in lab to people. The way I look at these less invasive procedures is the surgery, short of some of the minor um, technological issues with whether it's long-stemmed instruments or that sort of thing, um, is largely the same. Mitral surgery is largely the same once you get there, um, than whether you're doing it transdermally or minimally. Basically, the same with coronary surgery. So I think one of the things that's important to take home from this sort of a hands-on lab is how you get there and how you get out. Once you're there, then we can talk about the you know minor tech, uh, technical issues that go along with performing an operation well um, in a less invasive way. So for direct access uh, coronary surgery, the, the things that we think about as far as getting there have to do with doing this for the right patient. Um, and as Sloan mentioned yesterday, s same is true from uh, mitral surgery to coronary surgery, picking the right patient and staying out of trouble is a really important thing. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, um, making appropriate incisions and where those incisions are when we get to the lab. Um, from a getting it done standpoint, there are some minor differences. Looking at the mammary from the other side matters a little bit, and we'll talk about some minor technical issues that um, can go along with that. Finding the LED and creating a quality anastomosis are all part of that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, finishing up. So um, as we talked in the beginning about transition, um, the question is, how would you use this technology? You, there just aren't very many patients anymore that cardiologists don't manage with single vessel disease that we get sent for um, revascularization. So one of the questions is going to be, how are you going to do this to start? Um, and you know, we've had discussions among us for years about managing multivessel disease, which is the predominance of what we see. And is that something that one can go to through a, whether it's a direct access incision or TCAB robotic, or is there a transition? And that transition, I would encourage you to at least consider, might be hybrid. Um, for years, we've talked about the results of non-arterial graphs in non-LED uh, non systems. And the results that um, have been achieved with drug-eluting stents in those territories. And so I'm going to talk for a few minutes about um, what, in fact, the guidelines have told us about potentially for hybrid revascularization. So in my hands anyway, the relative contraindications to this sort of an approach have to do with um, mostly anatomy, um, you know, diffusely diseased vessels, small vessels, intramyocardial vessels, um, poor ventricular function as a manifestation of relatively little patient um, uh, uh, recovery, um, reoperations, those sort of things. As we'll talk about in the lab, there's a difference between how you approach this incision um, for most patients um, for mid-cab, mixed cabbage, I prefer the fifth interspace because I believe the mammary can be taken down um, more robustly um, and end up with a longer graft, with, which gives you a lot more flexibility in an anastomosis. Um, if you're going to manage multivessel mix and manage the aorta, the fourth interspace is where you need to be. Um, and we can talk about the nuances there. Um, I'm briefly going to run through these slides. I mean, this gives you a little bit of idea of what we're looking at as far as positioning and incisions, and we'll talk more about that in the lab. Um, uh, there are some devices that um, have been developed over the years to help us with this, as with many of these things, and we'll talk about retractors and stabilizers and that sort of thing to allow um, this to be done safely um, through a uh, smaller incision. Um, and uh, again, we'll go through a lot of this in the lab. Um, and you know, closing is a little bit like the robotic situation yesterday. Sometimes you just can't quite get everything you need. Um, it's just a little bit of a different uh, exit strategy than, um, than it has been in the past. But I think we'll talk about more about that in the lab. So I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes just talking a little bit about how hybrid may um, be a useful adjunct, particularly as a transition, but if not uh, um, as a destination strategy for minimal invasive coronary surgery. So we know the mammary of the LED is pretty much golden from a revascularization standpoint. Um, when we started doing this, we did completion arteriogram to be sure that we were doing okay and we weren't hurting anybody. That I think has become less important, um, but you know, still um, from a hybrid standpoint, we've uh, uh, 
tried to emphasize the durability of a mammary of the LAD um, with uh, less invasiveness of PCI as a, uh, at least a consideration as a combination. In 2011 was the first time that actually this showed up in the guidelines, uh, where uh, the ACCHA guidelines started to talk about recommending heart team approach to coronary revascularization, um, uh, similar to the uh, heart team approach that had been espoused for um, uh, for catheter-based interventions on in, in valve disease, um, and. Uh, so we have sort of followed that lead um, and began to finally discuss patient populations that may be reasonable to consider um, uh, for a, a hybrid approach. In that guideline, it was really an unprecedented call for collaboration among cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, and I think that people who have set up programs like that, Fran will talk about it a little bit as well, um, I think have found this to be um, exceedingly um, uh, positive for the program and, um, uh, and something that can actually be marketed, um, whether by word of mouth or otherwise. Um, furthermore, those guidelines went on to, again, talk about um, uh, patients with um, uh, who, certain subsets of patients um, in whom a, an approach like this would be a reasonable thing, patients with uh, the inability to create uh, multiple proximal anastomoses, um, distal targets that um, uh, may be amenable to PCI where coronary surgery may not be reasonable, um, lack of suitable graft conduit. So that's where we started with um, hybrid vascularization. Um, uh, and additionally, it, uh, uh, it became at least part of the guidelines to consider this as an attempt to improve overall risk benefit uh, ratios, uh, which is a pretty um, pretty big deal from the ACCAHA to come out with. In 2014, um, those guidelines went further to talk a little bit about patient populations uh, with complex multivessel disease or those with diabetes in whom a hybrid approach um, uh, may be reasonable. And we're talking about relatively strong recommendations now. Um, what Mark is going to tell you later is unfortunately the 2021 guidelines didn't really tell us very much about hybrid surgery and they did create an enormously uh, a controversial um, uh, 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 snake pit for us with regard to revascularization. The one thing they did mention is what is true and that is that what we were hoping would come out of the, uh, the one randomized controlled trial looking at um, hybrid revascularization isn't going to be as helpful as we thought because that uh, trial since the last guidelines has closed because of low enrollment. So um, I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, I believe that there is a national, natural evolution from traditional coronary surgery to less invasive surgery um, for experienced um, uh, technically able surgeons. Um, the one thing that I go back to on a regular basis is, um, and I think we need to keep in mind, you heard a little bit about this yesterday, that the completeness of the operation and the quality of the operation cannot be compromised by a less invasive approach. It just has to be a smaller hole. Same graph, same places, smaller incision. Um, the learning curve, I believe, can be shortened by experiences like this, by peer training, by simulation, and um, that's why I think this is such a valuable experience for attendees um, to um, be able to uh, network with um, approachable uh, faculty to uh, help you make that transition. Um, engaging, engaging cardiology, I think, is um, vitally important, um, and uh, uh, to establish a level of collaboration to achieve early success in a program um, is what um, will get that jump started. And these are the sorts of things that set programs and hospitals apart from their competition. Um, I still believe that this will be data driven, whether it comes from uh, a randomized hybrid trial or data, or early data from that trial. Um, that's still going to have to be an important part of this. Um, and I think the question will be where the penetrance will come from with regard to multivessel disease. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Really fantastic overview of CAP, mixed CAP, and I think some really important lessons to be taken away for all of minimal invasive cardiac surgery. 
Next up will be uh, Rodrigo de Souza, who will be talking about endoscopic cabbage. And as you will see, it's essentially iteration of the same procedure with slightly different approaches. So excited to hear his talk. Good morning, everyone. So um, while it uh, loads, uh, good morning, everyone. So the, the point here is to talk, it's, um, I'm going to be um, uh, repetitive on a few steps that was um, said before for the, by, by the first presenter. But um, the point here is to show um, an alternative, alternate <coughs> approach to, yeah, it is connected. It worked yesterday, so <coughs> is this one right? Let's try the other. Mm -hmm. Flip it up, Franz. If you don't mind coming up, uh, we'll have Franz Sutter talk about um, robotic cabbage, one of the okay. robotic cab talks, <coughs> and then we can go back to Dr. D'Souza's talk. Okay, good. I am not Hirav Patel, <laughs> just in case you're wondering, but he asked me to uh, step up for him. And um, so I was lucky enough to bring my computer with a lot of different presentations, and I put them together. And I hope we come out okay. Where's the uh, next? Oh, here, go. Is mine going to come? Can we get the slides up for Dr. Sutter? So anyway, I, I my presentation. Thank you. Aha, my presentation is something to. Um, sort of incentivize people. Most people don't like doing coronaries. I don't like doing them, except I like robotic ones. But I'm trying to incentivize people. So the point of this is not a whole lot of robots, and nothing's different since Favaloro did the first one like 50 years ago. So, um, so at my place, we've done 5,000 cases so since our first robot in May 2005. But since then, we've done 2,348 robots, which is 47% of all cabbage done by all surgeons at my institution. So it has an impact. And just the fact that it's been 16 years of doing this many robots, and every year it's getting to be a little bit more than 50% uh, of all the cases, all the cabbage cases, has to say something, no matter what my data, but the data is okay too. <laughs> anyway, put three ports in, usually the camera port is in and about the nipple, not necessarily at the fourth or fifth intercostal space. I'll do that in the lab, I'll talk about it. You can get to the LAD diagonals, um, high takeoff marginals, Sam can get to them better, but mostly it's an operation 
a lima to LAD that we do, which 80% of the time it's lima to LAD, and then the other times it's like a diagonal or something. So basically, you open the pericardium, and I like to put clips where my target is, and I have a way to figure that out uh, so that the camera port is right over the target spot so that I just increase the incision size of the camera port to do the thoracotomy. Anyway, taking down the mammary, as Steve just said, it's, it's challenging when you're going from the left side because invariably, like this is a good example, you always have tons of fat, you have more muscle that you have to go through because you're coming from the left side instead of through a sternotomy. And the, important, the most important part of this operation is taking down the mammary without damaging it. And the rest of it, if you just do a mid-cab with a big incision, you do fine. Your volume will increase because the patients will love it, the cardiologists will love it, because the robot really, other than having three holes in your chest, you don't beat up the chest wall, which is a problem. And you'll find that your thoracotomy size will come down. But basically, identify the course of the lima right off the bat, from proximal to distal. And then when I get down to distal, then I start doing circumferential dissection. Usually I do some on the medial side first where there's few branches, and then the lateral side uh, where there's more branches, and then like I clip all the branches. Um, I don't quarter, I did, but it's very distressing when you have bleeding from some small little thing that you think, well, maybe if I clipped it, we wouldn't have been back here in the middle of the night. So uh, anyway, we put clips on everything, and I cauterize distally. After the mammary's down, I tack it to the epicardium um, just so that it doesn't twist, because it really wants to go twist up to 720 degrees. Uh, and I didn't do this initially, but subsequently I had some loop-de-loops and it didn't work well. So there, I know where the LAD is, the mammary's just sitting there, so all you have to do is, through a small incision, sew a bypass, it's not difficult. And then after it's down, done, I take down the rest of the attachments of the mammary. Usually you leave the mammary uh, attached to the chest wall until, it's, until you're almost ready to take it down. And then you take down the rest of the attachments because if it's hanging down, you'll whack it with one of the instruments uh, because you're looking through a small keyhole to do this operation. And um, once it's down, make sure that there's no bleeding. I show this slide because you're looking across to the the rema on the other side of the chest. And you can do both mammaries through the three incision, three holes in the chest. And it works out very nicely. So when we use this stabilizer, um, what's this? So this, is, this isn't the current one that I use, but anyway, I'll show you that in a minute. You put the suction tubing in through the thoracotomy. This is a... Um, the port for the scope, which I've enlarged, and you bring it out the left. And then I put this pole in through the left port, and we connect them inside the chest. The, the current gadget is this gadget. Uh, same deal, suction tubing, it's just a different way to connect inside the chest. Okay, so all the robotic instruments have been removed from the chest, and this is the camera port. And the, the way that I do the operation, I have a little algorithm about how to sort of predict where I want to put my camera port, right over the target area. Um, anyway, you make the incision a little bit larger, uh, use a soft tissue retractor inside the chest. When the soft tissue retractor goes in, I always like to look to make sure it didn't catch one edge of the mammary that's sitting right underneath this hole, so I take a quick look. Now this is the left port. I have my little finger in the chest, my fifth finger, to sort of escort this Kelly into the chest, and then I put the stabilizer in there, and then I have to put the big pole in there, 
So again, I have my fifth finger in the chest, and I put this Kelly in, so as soon as the Kelly comes out, it doesn't go into the heart, it hits my finger. And then, very importantly, my finger is there for this, this uh, pole, and then you just connect the two inside the chest. You'll see a lot of marks on the chest. I like, there's, there's landmarks that really make a huge difference when doing it. And I end up not working necessarily on an inner space per se, but we'll talk about it in the lab. And then I take all the slack out of the mammary. Now there's the tacking stitch to maintain the orientation, but it's difficult to pull it taut with the robot so I pull out all the extra slack in the, in the mammary and I retack it, and then, and then I put a line on it. I put on a, just, just so it's easier to know that you're not causing it to twist, and then put a retractor tape on that has its own pledget, and then we're ready to, we open the artery, dissect it out, most of the time I put in an undersized shunt just to have it there, but uh, the retracted tape is just on tight. And then you just sew through a small hole. So this is the end product. These are the kind of incisions you end up with. You don't start making these incisions. You start with larger incisions, but it, it, the incision size comes down normally. So this is another example of the 47% of, but the reason I show this, this is all cabbage. We lost our certificate of need in Pennsylvania and had a direct impact on the volume of cases that we have. But anyway, the reason for this slide is I used to like to do mid-cabs. And we couldn't sell a mid-cab at our institution because they hurt too much. And then in 2005, when we start using the robot, all of a sudden it went up. So I would guess that it's, you know, because we didn't hurt the patient as much. Or you could say it's the sex appeal of the robot, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so these are some quick numbers. I have Lankanol, our experience in STS over here. But basically, um, with heart failure, about the same. EF less than 40, about the same. Because, you know, a lot of the patients have a risk of like 0.2%. But on the other hand, there's a whole lot of patients that nobody wants to do a sternotomy on. They can't tolerate it and they're very sick. And we do a robotic lima. 80% uh, have cabbage times one. just, And then 90% are extubated in the aquaps. How do you get it back? Well, anyway, 90% uh, are extubated in the, in the uh, OR, 2% are on a ventilator, and these are the kinds of patients that uh, are sick. Um, so stroke is less. Transfusion is less. Length of stay is less. Predicted as 1.9 and we're one. So, uh, we're ahead of the game with loss, and I want to talk briefly. We talked about uh, doing hybrids just to get some excitement. Now, everybody's doing their tavers. They talk about the heart team, but we've had a heart team at my place. Once a week, the coronary surgeons, there's two of us, uh, get together with six interventionalists, and we review cases, and then when a case comes up in the middle of the week that needs to be done, we just sent something out on the computer to all the cardiologists and surgeons, and everybody puts their two cents in, whether it's on the run or they just text. But it makes a difference. So um, hybrid is great, but importantly, 90% of all cabbage are vein grafts. We talk about arterial grafts, but the reality is vein grafts. Now, hybrid has to do with comparing vein grafts with stents, and the stent technology has gotten better and better. And, um, so patients, they don't understand. They don't understand why we can't do endoscopic surgery when everybody else does. Even the brain guys do endoscopic surgery. Um, so you all know about hybrids. I love this study, which talks about excess repeat revascularization with the balloon 
and going up to the first general or the, the second generation stent, how the stents are better and the cardiologist's ability to do stents is better. So they're getting better and better. And it makes all the sense in the world to do hybrids. So we know that PCI is getting better, PCI survival is good, and quality of life after PCI is a whole lot better than a sternotomy. And uh, we know that diabetics do better with full cabbage, and we need to work around the details. Uh, who gets it? Ideally, ideally, it's just sick patients that have morbidity and you just don't want to do a whole lot, but there's a whole lot of just makes sense. Most cardiologists, when they do a cath, as soon as they see that the LAD is not stenable, immediately, without thinking, they say, okay, need surgery. But the number of patients that come to me that the LAD is rotten, but the other vessels are like focal lesions that are just slam dunk stents, and in any other situation, the cardiologist would have stented them, but they don't even look at it. I look at each cath and I say, well, what can be stented before you know, I decide on whatever we're going to do? Um, so the reason I have talked about hybrids is they're an important part, 42% of all robots are hybrids, or 20% of all cabbage. That's a lot of hybrids. So you all see these studies where you have a total guys in shock, they stand it open and the normal stuff, they say, okay, it's got a bad LAD, a uh, bad LAD and a bad circumflex, you know, you need to fix it before he leaves the hospital and you don't want to touch him, but, you know, you just do a lima to LAD and then they make this, this lesion look like that. Or this 87-year-old, 80% left main, we just do a lima, and they do great. Or this patient, you can see the bifurcation disease here, and has like this focal, a little ratty here, but relatively focal lesion. We do a sequential to fix it, and then the cardiologist puts a stent in and makes it look pretty. Or this patient, which I said to the cardiologist, we need to do, you know, sternotomy because there's no way you're going to fix this. And of course, he said there is a way. So we did a lima to LAD, and then they made this this lesion look like look like that. Anyway, so our hybrids, just quickly, um, eighty-two percent. 82% are just cabbage times one. Same, same outcomes, 90% extubated on a ventilator, 1.4 complete. So, you know, the cardiologists, when we do these hybrids, they see, they see this, that's their patient. And um, atrial fibrillation is less, stroke is less, because we don't touch the aorta, we don't go on pump. Transfusion is less. Median length of stay is four days versus six days uh, predicted of 2.1 is a 1%. So um, now I followed up 4.9 years and our illustrious uh, ISMIX president followed up a little bit more and his data is actually better than mine, uh, but I'm not gonna show his. <laughs> So 30-day um, mortality was 0.9, and um, essentially we had survival data on all but two patients. Of interest, 13% of the patients never came for their, for their stent, and I think it's probably because they felt so good with the Lima to LAD that they didn't come back. Uh, so what happened in five years? 16% had return of angina, 12% had repeat revascularization, target vessel was the, the Problem 59% versus the uh, the non-target vessel was 59 versus the target vessel, and the important, the most important number here is everybody expects that well, you can do a hybrid, but you'll be back getting a sternotomy in no time. We had two patients out of 560, so statistically, 
there's a low chance of somebody coming back. Now we'll see it in 10 years. We're like just about to get this, uh, this data at my place and Bob's working on it. Um, and freedom from uh, May 77% and there's a lot of studies even on and off pump patients at, at five years. This is very competitive data. So uh, in, whoops, again, in closing, I think this is a really exciting procedure. Cabbage isn't exciting, but when you have outcomes that are better and you operate on sicker patients and you get them through and you have, did it again, and you have less atrial fibrillation, less blood transfusion, less vent, less stroke, it really makes making rounds easy and then your follow-ups are easy because they come in, they still have the same problem, but they have less of them. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Fran. Fantastic talk as expected, and thank you so much for being flexible to give this talk. The, the world is a pretty big place, but I think it's fair to say that Dr. Fran Sutter has the world's largest series of robotically assisted um, mid caps, so benefit from having him here. And I also say I really enjoyed how Sam looked at you as you were trying to shove the stabilizer through a small incision that's barely big enough for your finger. <laughs> so I think now we're going back to uh, Rodrigo de Souza, who will be talking about endoscopic <coughs> Lima harvest. You guys want to hear a joke? Take like 20 seconds, please. 20 seconds, Maurice. What? Keep counting, 20 seconds. We're counting? Uh, I'm go Swiss, on, 20 go, seconds is go pretty on quick. With the okay. joke. Oh, go on I'll be on the joke. clock. It's a yeah. Swiss clock, too. Good to play here. Let's see. Uh, Fran, can I ask you a question? They have, yeah, they have your slides. So, have you know, them. you've really pushed revascularization and you're really they going above and beyond to give the best possible oh, result. And you're talking about hybrid revascularization. Because the presentation is How many of your cardiologists use intravascular imaging when they do their PCI? What, what percentage? I think 40 percent. 40 percent. Yeah. That's pretty good. You know, if people remember the recently the FAME study, right? 10% intravascular imaging, it makes all the difference. It's and it's not something not we talk a lot about as surgeons, but I think if we, as we start talking about hybrid revascularization, I think both sides have to chip in and do their very best. Right, and I think you know that's obviously a very important part. The, the other aspect of it is optimizing PCI when they do their work, okay? I mean, the Achilles heel of PCI is underdeployed stent, area miss, geographic miss, all these things. So, you know, PCI can work well, but you have to do it right. There. Rodrigo, ready? I should be. <laughs> you, you're am, ready, but I the am slides actually, are not. Okay. Joys of the technology. I'm not sure why it's not taking it. Are you going to put yours in my Did you try the USB? Yeah. We have a keynote at the end. We played them all.
have someone to blame. I uh, hope it's not me. <clears throat> so good morning. Uh, so my point here is, first of all, let me make it clear. I am a huge fan of the robotic surgery. The only issue is that, unfortunately, so far I have not access to a robotic platform. But I am in line for that. So oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And so um, I've been doing that for the last 10 years, and it was, a, it was a, quite of a path. <clears throat> but uh, I think we uh, reached a point that we can do a very um, interesting surgery, and we can offer, I wouldn't say with the same um, easiness that robotic platform offers to the surgeon, but for the patient, the results are, are um, much appropriate. So once again, I always do that. When we talk about minimally invasive surgery, we're talking about teamwork. It's not about someone, some guy, some machine, or something uh, isolated, but it's a huge teamwork. We can see because anytime we talk about new technologies, we do like hundreds and thousands of mock cases to start before getting to the patient with that. So it's really important that everyone is on board with this idea, otherwise it's not gonna work. <clears throat> so, Cabbage is the best treatment, of course, for um, um, patients with multivascular and complex coronary disease, but especially the ones in high risk for wound complications, like uh, diabetic patients, for instance. Uh, it has proven long-term benefits, but also has a significant invasiveness, it's, which is bad. So it's hard to tell someone when he gets into your clinic that, well, that's fine, you're gonna be fine, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna open, like, run over you and crack your chest, like, up to bottom. And generally people get like white and say, yeah, maybe there's another chance to do anything else other than that. Um, and the problem with invasiveness is that full sternotomy um, uh, leads to infection, slow recovery, pain, inflammation, bleeding. The bypass uh, triggers inflammation, also kidney failure, bleeding, atrial fibrillation. And the cross clamping, I, uh, I really don't think that strokes and the data shows that the strokes are not really uh, are related to um, to the bypass itself, but actually uh, it's much more related to aortic manipulation. <clears throat> and uh, of course, when you do open graft harvesting, it's not very um, pleasant for the patient. And um, even radio or vein grafts, you can have you will have another wound, big wound, and can lead to infection. And of course, one thing that I'd like to mention here, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, is hybrid coronary revascularization that I think, I'm, I'm positively think that's not future, but I think it's, it's what we should do like in present because we have data supporting that. Uh, not direct data, but uh, uh, non-direct data. Um, and the good thing about hybrid is that when you use a minimally invasive strategy to do the cabbage part of the hybrid treatment, uh, we have a huge experience using um, not suspending the, the DAPT before doing the cabbage part. And what we see is that the difference in bleeding is almost none, non significant at least. But once again, it's an adult, it's not, it's not published. <clears throat> so, um, like 10 to 15 percent, uh, percent centers in USA do off pump cabbage regularly. And mixed cabbage doing like on pump with clamping or not, or off pump, pump assisted, is just one to two percent in, in centers uh, of centers of US. And using total arterial strategy is just less than one percent regularly. One thing that we did as, uh, once we get uh, to the UCSF is that despite being minimally invasive strategy, open chest, today 98 percent of our patients get bilateral IMAs, uh, both IMAs scalpelized. And the reason why it's not 100% is because we have single vessel disease, and then we use just one IMA. Otherwise, it would be 100%. Um, and um, the, the main characteristics of uh, total arterial mixed cabbage is no sternotomy, no car prefer preferably no cardiopulmonary bypass. Then you can use pump assisted in the beginning, of course, no cross clamping. Um, we, you can use uh, bilateral IMAs, radio, gastric diploid arteries, so we have a lot to explore. Um, no aortic manipulation, which is better. Um, it comes with a little bit more uh, experience with that, but um, it comes. Uh, you can do um, harvest both IMAs endoscopically with endoscopic assistance from the left side, 
and of course doing a radio endoscopic too. And, and it's absolutely essential to, adapt, uh, to adopt the um, uh, ERES protocol. I've shown you before. So what would be the indications and contraindications for minimally invasive cabbage? Uh, would be the main indications would be high risk uh, patients for a deep sternal wound infection. Uh, the patient desire for early recovery to normal activity. It's amazing because when you do um, to get patients back to full physical activity with a standard cabbage, sometimes most of the time you take 10 to 12 weeks, so they can like bungee jumping or something. Uh, and when you do minimally invasive, in two, I, I have lots of patients in two weeks at the gym doing absolutely everything, and it's really good. Um, elderly and frail, frail patients are good candidates for that uh, by, because of obvious reasons. Uh, younger patients where, that we can use offer bilateral IMAs, especially in younger patients, we do not use the strategy of crossing the midline with the right IMA because this patient might need something in the future, so we do composite grafts, and data shows that the result of composite grafts or, or um, pedicle grafts like Rima to LAD and Lima to the left side is absolutely the same, no major different, difference. <clears throat> and of course, one, one of the most elegant indications for mixed cabbage is hybrid coronary revascularization, and cosmetic aspect is important too. And the contraindications would be small and severe uh, uh, three vessel disease, which means that if the patient is like that, probably he's not a candidate, not for a mixed cabbage, but not candidate for a cabbage at all. Um, uh, emergent cases, um, I don't think these cases are suitable to be done, um, I would say off pump, um, less invasive possible, but with pump system, pump assistance, you can do that with no major issues, so it's not a, a big indication anymore, a big contraindication anymore. Uh, this is a problem that we could not fix so far, the patients that have uh, ch a severe chest wall deformity. I did last week a patient, uh, a bilateral mam, mixed cabbage, two vessel disease, triple vessel disease, but it was a hybrid, they, they stented the right side, and the patient has a, not a complete, but an incomplete pectus. So it was quite a challenge to get the rima from the left side with an incomplete pectus, but the patient is at home and doing fine. So this remains a problem, sorry. Um, uh, poor EF and dilated heart, are, is a, they are both a problem, but we can uh, supplant that using the, the pump assistance. And when you think about crossing, uh, getting into the pleural space in patients with COPD, we think about lots of complications, right? But what data shows us on this is that the results are better, better for these patients when you do the mixed cabbage strategy, even though you need to get into the pleural space than the patients that go to full sternotomy. So this is, the f this is the final result that we expect. So you see here, one thing that we can see here is that we open both pleural spaces. This is a Rima to LAD patient and the Lima to OM. Mostly like this. The images are not as beautiful as robotic images, but we try hard. We're still trying, actually. So <clears throat> this is a patient that um, after five years, we did um, CT angiogram. Uh, coronary angiogram, and we can see here the Rima perfectly to the LAD and the Lima to the left side. This patient was a hybrid, one of my first cases of hybrid. Uh, and a, a good thing to say about that is that we talk about hybrid strategy would be like Lima to LAD and all the rest stenting. And right now, a um, uh, few of us, we are discussing about what we call extender, extended or advanced hybrid that would be using use the, the mixed uh, cabbage part of the hybrid strategy using bilateral IMAs and not just one IMA. And all the rest then stented. And this patient has a stent here on the right side. So five years with this control, the results are perfect. And this is what we expect doing that. This is not, like, once again, it's not robotically, but it's quite okay in my, in my humble opinion here. We almost don't see um, any incision on this guy, we can see a few because it's 
skin is more clear. So some important points to think is that long-term patency for SVGs are being questioned in literature a lot. And w right now we have data showing that we have one-year failure rates up to 40, 46%. And the last generated DES have a one-year restenosis rate of less than 5%. So let's be honest, when we compare SVGs with, uh, with the stents for non-LAD lesions, for instance, we lose and we lose bad. Um, and the optimal revascularization revasculariz strategy would combine a minimally invasive procedure that reduces perioperative risk and optimize your ability and survival. So why doing BIMA and extending the surgical part of the hybrid strategy on mixed cabs? It's, has, it has proven to achieve best short and long-term results. Bilateral, the best quantity to perform pedicle and composite graft for left side targets. It has a lower morbidity compared uh, to and, and compared mortality to sternotomy, less bleeding, less arrhythmias, uh, less deep sternal wound infection, less pain, short length of stay, and uh, shorter uh, return to full physical activities. And one thing that we see is that the acceptance from the patient is extremely high. So it's just uh, something to illustrate about hybrid strategy and show that. Uh, the survival with the hybrid strategy in the long term because, of course, we're using uh, memory is higher than when you compare with PCI with stents. So hybrid is a great opportunity for our interventional cardiologists and CT surgeons to work together and off the best of two worlds, as it has, has been said before. Strives to, combination, to combine advantage and avoid limitations of uh, uh, single strategies. And when you use minimally invasive, you don't have to stop that to do that. So there's no standardizing method like who's, go f who's gonna go first or both at the same moment if you have a hybrid room to do that. Uh, but surgeons to adopt that and offer that to, his to their cardiologists, they should be really, really comfortable to mix cavity structure even if it's single lima or, or bilateral RNAs. And he has a lower rate of blood transfusion, um, shorter uh, ventilation time, length of stay time. And for elective patients, lima to LAD plus uh, sequentially, uh, PCI to non-LED lesions has adv an advantage that you can shoot the lima graft and see if your work is, is fine. But there's an opportunity for selected acute coronary syndrome patients with uh, non-LED culprit lesions. They can PCI first and then we do lima to LED or bilateral IMAs to, lim to LED and another um, uh, landing uh, target on the right side in the same admission or not. So um, PCI has lower procedure morbidity, comparable for uh, low complexity uh, disease, uh, low incidence of instant, instant risk nose in, in the short term. Cabbage has the best durability, less repeat revask, but uh, good, ac excellent symptoms relief, higher procedure morbidity, best for diffuse revascular high disease complex patients, and best in, in diabetic patients with low EF. And, um, but hybrid has low procedure morbidity, minimally invasive, but LAD still be treated with a lima. Non-LAD vessels could be comparable, comparable results treated with PCI, and is an alternative pathway to patients to, um, with anatomy suitable, suitable for cabbage, but with comorbidities that can complicate the procedure. So that patient, who, when you get worried about not the surgery itself, but the patient itself, because of comorbidities, might be a great candidate for hybrid. So what we know about mix is that there's less pain, less stroke, faster extubation. Uh, we also have more than 70% um, uh, rate of extubation in the OR with patients in mixed cabbage. Uh, better and fast recovery, excellent patency using total through strategy, less blood loss even when using DAPT, um, enhanced opportunity of hard teamwork, and better aesthetics. So how to do that? The ergonomics of this thing is like um, we do, uh, how we proceed, like position the patient, I'm gonna show you at the wet lab, but generally what we do is that we open right below the left nipple in man or in the mammary crease for woman, and then with the echo, we locate the apex, the apex before that, and we can open one space above. The other method, if you don't want to do an echo in the OR to, to locate the apex, 
you can just open it when you reach the fourth intercostal space you open just a little bit just enough to put your finger in when you palpate the apex if your finger is going down you're in the right spot if your finger is going up then you're too low then you go one space above um, and then um, this mini thoracotomy side um, it's about two inches we do put a, a thorough track with a sky hook there are a few positionings for the right and the left side I can show you at the wet lab uh, the camera port is, go, uh, is uh, get in um, one or two spaces above and then to your mid axillary line and you have also one more um, step one incision here to put one stabilizer. If you're going to use um, um, uh, um, star, uh, starfish, then you can uh, put another step one here below the xiphoid. Um, so this is the ergonomics of the stuff, so you see that once again, it's not robotic, but we can uh, watch the TV all the time. Um, most of the time, at least, to harvest the memories and um, to assist during the anastomosis. But it's important. Uh, some people like to have an iron assist here. I prefer to have someone that I can um, be angry with. <laughs> it's, it's hard to shout with the, <laughs> with the iron assist. So these are images of memory, memory harvesting. Uh, one thing that is, um, uh, brings the attention is that when you see, uh, one thing that the robot, the robot does that uh, uh, the, the endoscopic video assistance doesn't do is that it can remove all your shaking and, and is it, it, is, it is enhanced like 10 times. So if you have a very small shake in your hand, it looks like an earthquake there. But especially because it's a, they're long instruments, and the, the robot does, uh, clears that very well. It's a huge advantage. But um, the strategy is to skeletonize both memories, and for small branches, we do not clip anything. We just clip big branches. Uh, we do not use harmonics, just very, very, very low energy bovi, regular bovi and extender, right? I have a better video to show you, so just to illustrate that. So this is the LAD, the Lima harvesting. I'm sorry I could not uh, edit the video, but you can see the image is really clear. Um, you have a very detailed, and once again, two important things. First of all, of all you need to be patient. Don't try to run because you can um, screw everything up. And the second point is that um, uh, is that you can, um, you, you, not, you do not need to be worried about burning the memory as long as you use at low energy bovi. All our cases we test with TTFM and most of them right now we use an ultrasound to um, check the anastomosis and the flows are, the memory flows are always great unless you have any problem before, like irradiation or something like that. So. Let me see here. Uh, s one thing that I'd like to mention is that uh, we have lots, tons of paper actually published saying about skeletonizing memories increase the risk of deep sternal wound infection. I am pretty convinced about something that is most of the times uh, on open chest surgery who gets your memory is a, is a fellow most of the time. And they're really worried about not leaving anything bleeding, which means that at the end of the skeletonization, what they do is like doing barbecue with the chest wall of the patient, like burning everything. And this is a problem because if you get a memory skeletonized and then you burn everything at the end, it's the same as getting, not getting the memory skeletonized. So the problem with deep sternal wound infection is not the skeletonization, is what you do with the chest wall. This is the problem. I'm pretty convinced about that. But once again, it's just my opinion. There's no strong data about that. Yes, that also. So, yes, yeah, quite a repetitive. So let me see if I have a shot of everything here. Let me see if I have a shot of the memory at the end. I'm gonna show you how to do that.
And, and the good thing is that using the endoscopic, you can a, in, do a very good inspection on the chest wall and see if there's any kind of bleeding that can complicate you that. So look at the memory, looks really good. <clears throat> so and the biggest question that, what, that everyone asked me, okay, that's fine, we saw that, that's beautiful, but let's go to the right side. That's the question that everyone asks. So what we do when you we, when we go to the right side, this is the view of the right side memory from the left side using endoscopic, uh, and, uh, uh, endoscopic assistance. So uh, generally what I do is like I open the fascia before on mid, mid portion of the, of the uh, memory veins just to get the space to grab the memory. And everything, this is being doing from the left side. So, to reach there, a few strategies can be used. Number one, we need to clear everything that's in, an, in the anterior uh, um, uh, compartment of the mediastinum. So, all that fat from the diaphragm to the innominate vein, everything needs to be removed. It's quite easy, no problem, it takes a little bit while, but it's, it's doable. And the second thing is that if you think that you're, uh, actually three things, and the second thing, if you think that your, your heart is too big or, or something is preventing you to get to get a good view, open the right pleura all the way up to bottom. And then you can put like four or five stitches on the right aspect of the, the, right, the right pleural reflect, reflection and then pull everything through the left side, which is going to make you turn the, the, the heart to the left side and bring it down so you can have more space to, to work. These veins sometimes complicate things because it's sometimes painful, especially when you hit that. And this is the trick. Use very, very low energy bovi. And then you go opening the fascia and slowly dissection and harvesting the memory. Okay, let's move on. So, I'm going to show you how to get there and, 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 and perform the anastomosis and use the video assistance at the wet lab, but some take-home message that I would like to... So, it, it is feasible to do the RIMA from the left side, first of all. So, some take-home messages. Always move from simple cases to complex cases. Start with a few Lima to LAD, and then if you need to, even doing Lima to LAD, do a cross clamp do some cardioplegia because 15, 20 minutes of cardioplegia is not going to do a major harm, but you get a perfect anastomosis, especially in the beginning. Then try a few lima harvest using direct view to get used to the setup, and then move to endoscopic harvesting. Endoscopic is, is essential to harvest the rima. You can do the lima using direct view, but the, the rima is really complicated. Always skeletonize using extremely low energy, 15 to 20 on, bovi, on your bovi. Always use the fascia as a grabbing point. If you need to use your weight just to bring the IMA down, that's fine, but don't grab it. And um, if you need a third graft, radio artery, artery harvesting endoscopically is really easy and straightforward. And you can do a composite T or Y graft or free radio from, from aorta data show the same results like uh, regarding patency. And always check your flows after going off pump with, with normal hemodynamics. It's not unusual when you check the flow before getting normal hemodynamics and your flow is not adequate. And then when you get a, a, like a normal hemodynamics, good BP, good heart rate, heart is ejecting fine, then your, uh, your uh, flow, me flow measurement is really accurate and adequate. Thank you.
Thank you, Rodrigo. Really great talk. And you touched a lot on multi arterial grafting. We're currently writing the guidelines, CAA, TS, STS guidelines on multi arterial grafting. I'd love to have some more conversation about that. But I think, in the interest of time, we'll go to none less than Robocop himself, Dr. Sam Balke. Uh, good morning. Um, that was an excellent and highly technically demanding HDMI. This should do it. Okay, be there. It's there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Dr. D'Souza, hats off to you um, on achieving that because I think it's extremely hard uh, using uh, that type of uh, instrumentation. 2D and long instruments shafted very hard. I think if we were to give you a robot, you'd just go off the charts. So get a robot. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about pretty much an amalgamation of what Fran talked about and what uh, uh, Rodrigo talked about, which is uh, robotic uh, TCAB and trying to be uh, more multi-vessel than single vessel as much as possible. I've been doing robotic coronary surgery uh, for about 15 years now, and our total number is approaching 1,000, uh, probably close to 300 in my previous practice in Milwaukee, and uh, now about 700 or so uh, in Chicago. And I was buoyed by uh, an extensive experience in off-pump bypass, uh, which, uh, as uh, Steve talked about, is a dying uh, specialty, unfortunately, and we, we always are looking to revive it. But then also, and more importantly, by the uh, availability of anastomotic devices, which I perfected in the open chest on a beating heart off pump before I started using them uh, in the robotic uh, setting. And so when I started having access to the robot, I uh, basically um, did a first Lima takedown and then a mid-cab incision. And I'm not good at looking through small incisions, and I realized that the endoscopic environment with a 3D camera and uh, wristed instruments is pretty much your playground. You can go anywhere. You're not limited by disease in the target if you're through a fourth interspace or, or a fifth interspace. And you can go further down on the LAD and you can go to various places. So I think that um, I did like five or so mid-cabs um, with the robot uh, harvesting and decided that I needed to move quickly to a T-cab, and, and that's kind of what I did, starting with simple procedures and then moving on to multivessel and bilateral IMAs. Um, so I'm going to show you a 16 and a half minute video live in a box case that we did for the Techno College. Um, and, uh, but before that, I'll just describe a little bit about our procedure uh, and why I think T-cab is good because um, it, it is, uh, I think, uh, uh, less demanding than when you saw Rodrigo uh, execute uh, because of, uh, of what I had said. It takes advantage of the superior visualization and the magnification of the robotic system during what invariably, I think most would agree, is the most um, critical part of the procedure. Um, so so you've, you've basically got all this, this technology uh, and, and you can use it during the most critical part of the procedure, which is the, um, uh, the anastomosis. Uh, it avoids rib spreading, which obviously when you see Fran operate, there's no rib spreading, but um, I think uh, many of the procedures do require mid -spreading, rib spreading for obese patients uh, and um, uh, less favorable patients. A body habitus with a BMI of 22 you can make a really small incision and not rib spread, but if you have a BMI of 40 or 50, then um, you're going to make a bigger cut invariably. The robot, on the other hand, doesn't know the BMI of the patient. You make the 8 millimeter port uh, the same way for, for all the patients. There's two um, meta-analyses that I want to draw your attention to that have talked about TCAB. TCAB was the first operation done by the Da Vinci robot in 1998 by Didier Lumet. And um, it has, there have been a lot of uh, papers and, and studies that are done. These are two meta-analyses, one by Gaudino and friends, and the other uh, by uh, Johannes Bonatti and colleagues that looked at, um, you know, this one had, I think, uh, 17 studies, uh, over 3,500 patients with good mortality and good early patency and a low repeat revascularization. And this one had 19 studies all over about 20 years uh, also 
Uh, this one shows, uh, Johannes's paper shows that uh, over the years, the time in surgery uh, went down significantly. So I draw your attention to those two meta-analyses. Um, I gave a talk once, uh, that uh, the title of which was, uh, is TCAB for the surgeon or for the patient? And I truly believe that TCAB is for the patient, uh, although it is for the surgeon as well, because you get to sit down through the whole procedure. Um, but these are the uh, benefits that I think uh, that we've heard uh, this morning before. Uh, but I think two of the ones that we focus less on are the last two in red. Uh, we found that our patients uh, use significantly less opioids after surgery. And I think that's a major, major uh, um, uh, issue to, to focus on. Uh, and I think most of us who do minimally invasive surgery find that. Uh, and then there's potential for less uh, postoperative depression, which happens in our younger patients who have a sternotomy um, and have their uh, chest cracked open. Um, just a quick uh, couple of slides on data. We published on 544 TCABs um, and presented this at the EX meeting a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see our conclusions were uh, that uh, the uh, uh, mortality was 0.9% and 97% early graft patency. Uh, and uh, we had a follow-up of 38 months in these 544 patients. Freedom from MACE was, uh, was 93%. Uh, and you can see the uh, survival uh, and the MACE curves there uh, to the right. Uh, this is what our procedure looks like, and, and you'll see this in the video. Uh, we don't use um, a double lumen tube in the majority of time. We just use a bronchial blocker. And the workhorse of this operation is this guy right here, the stabilizer, which is unfortunately available only on the SI robot and we're making strong, strong moves with collaborators and in industry uh, to try to fix that problem. Intuitive is not yet interested um, in, in, in making a stabilizer for the XI. Unfortunately, they haven't come to this meeting and seen all these young faces that want to do TCABs, but uh, hopefully they'll, they'll wake up to that fact soon. But other industry partners that are involved in stabilization are looking at ways to create a stabilizer that can be adopted to an, a pre-existing instrument on the XI. Uh, and hopefully that will come to fruition uh, before too long. So if you can um, dim the lights a little bit. Is there sound? Can you hear that? Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, operating room number four at the University of Chicago Medicine. Um, on behalf of myself and our team members here today, we are happy to present to you this multi-vessel, totally endoscopic coronary bypass procedure performed using the uh, robotic system, the Da Vinci SI. So for this procedure, we're not gonna use a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, which is an advantage of the, cat of the robotic technique. But in order to do so, then the patient needs to be, continue to be ventilated during the surgery. But the robotic arms need to actually access the chest. And so what we do for that procedure, essentially, is we do lung isolation. So the endotracheal tube has a special device inside of it called the bronchial blocker. That sits inside the endotracheal tube and actually goes down and will isolate the lungs. That is to say, during the procedure, we will only ventilate one out of his two lungs preferentially to allow the robotic arms to access and Dr. Balki and his team to go ahead and do the bypass graft surgery. So our patient today is from out of state who um, presented with an acute coronary syndrome and was diagnosed with uh, significant uh, coronary artery disease uh, in the form of a uh, tight proximal left anterior descending uh, in two areas. I can show you here, proximally here and uh, a little bit more distally just uh, prior to this uh, diagonal branch as well as what looks like an osteal circumflex lesion that's a little bit subtle, uh, which we supplanted with a CT angiogram to uh, confirm that it actually exists uh, with a good large uh, first obtuse marginal branch. Uh, you can't really see this lesion in all the views, uh, but um, it's about a 65 to 70% uh, stenosis uh, with a good uh, first obtuse marginal branch. And then he has a uh, a lesion in his right coronary in the mid-right that's about a 70% uh, stenosis here in the mid-right uh, coronary artery. So here you can see at the very beginning there's a haziness here which uh, after confirmation with uh, CT angiography it turns out that it's about a 65 to 70% lesion. So we will plan to graft his left anterior descending as well as this uh, first obtuse marginal 
and then um, the patient will be uh, uh, brought to the cath lab in a staged fashion uh, a couple of days later uh, for a PCI of his right coronary in order to achieve um, uh, full revascularization of his three-vessel coronary disease. So uh, we start off with uh, kind of mapping the chest wall. Uh, this is the um, sternal notch, the sternal angle of Louis, and the second rib, and then the uh, xiphoid process and the costal margin. Normally, I would place my ports uh, in the second, fourth, and sixth interspace just along the anterior axillary line. So this is the uh, second interspace, fourth interspace, and sixth interspace where we plan our ports. We start with the three ports for the uh, IMA harvesting, and then we place our two extra ports after the uh, two internal mammary arteries are mostly harvested. I like to make the incisions all at once. So as we use the knife and then we put it down, uh, we start off, we have two CO2 insufflators. One of them is the air seal uh, system, and uh, the other one is a humidified CO2 uh, system uh, from uh, Stryker called Insaflow. Here we start off with a varus needle, which is the um, kind of uh, exploring needle loaded with CO2. We keep the CO2 at a pressure of 10, um, and uh, we start by asking the anesthesiologist to turn the lungs down and disconnect them. We totally disconnect the uh, endotracheal tube so that the positive pressure in the airway is completely released and uh, the heart is not pushed towards the chest. Uh, and we insert this into the fourth interspace initially. Hear the click, come back out. And just in case there is an adhesion there, we try to achieve it in another area. And so now we're insufflated. We watch the hemodynamics obviously very carefully and we um, dilate this camera port and so now we've connected our 12 millimeter port, which is inserted in the fourth interspace, and we've connected it to the CO2 at a pressure of about 10. So we turn the lights down, not fully, but just to be able to get a good view. The uh, scope is inserted through the fourth interspace. We make sure that the lung is down. We have no adhesions, and then we ask the anesthesiologist to please inflate the left bronchial blocker and uh, breathe the right lung. And generally, I will place a uh, long eight millimeter port in the second interspace for the right arm. And that is uh, in order to avoid conflict uh, with the shoulder. So now we got our right arm in. And here we don't really look at the chest wall. We just look at the apex of the heart. You can see some adhesions there between the left lung and the apex. We'll have to take those down. And then we'll put our left arm port in. We like to hear the CO2 kind of hiss back at us as we're putting these ports in. And now that we're now that our ports in, we will uh, now go to docking of the robot. Straight, 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 and stop. And so we have the central column not be lined up with the camera port, but more lined up with the right arm port. And we start off with a 30 degree up camera monopolar curved scissors in the right arm and the Maryland forceps bipolar in the left. And now we've got the posterior pericardium. I usually generally look at the phrenic nerve as to where it is and uh, try to gain some insight as to the rotation of this heart. Um, if we see a lot of posterior pericardium, then uh, I kind of am comforted by the fact that the heart is rotated medially and we can get to the marginal branches uh, easier than if the heart was rotated posteriorly or laterally where we wouldn't be able to. I make a posterior pericardiotomy whether or not we are planning to graft the uh, posterior wall. So in this case, we're gonna make a little bit of a more generous opening. Our next move is to uh, go in and open up the uh, right pleura. But before we do that, we're going to kind of peel off this uh, extra pericardial fat and use it as a uh, cover for our uh, graft uh, to the anterior wall. So here we are opening up the anterior pericardium to identify the left anterior descending. The entry point into the right pleural space usually happens uh, just uh, under the uh, sternum in the upper mediastinal area away from the heart. 
We start off with harvesting the right uh, internal thoracic artery. So as I like to say, TCAB in three acts. And so the first act is harvesting of the donor vessel. Second act is preparation of the recipient vessel. And the third act is um, uh, connecting the two. So it's continuing the harvesting of the left internal thoracic artery after we've done the top half of the right. The bottom half of the right will have to wait until the stabilizer comes in. So here we are now creating the space for the fourth robotic arm. The port will be placed in the subcostal area. So this here is the uh, endo wrist stabilizer, which uh, makes this case possible. So it functions as not only a stabilizer for the coronary arteries, but also as a positioner uh, for the heart. So we're going to put this through a 12 millimeter port that is placed subcostally. So we're right here, uh, probably just lateral to the mid clavicular line in the subcostal area. So this is a 12 millimeter port right about there is where we want to be. And you can see that on the inside. And then we dilate with an eight and then a 12. And then finally, the port itself. And uh, the fourth arm comes right underneath this uh, left arm. And then we insert the uh, endo wrist stabilizer. It has three tubes coming out of it, uh, two for the vacuum and one for the irrigation. And then we're going to move up towards the anterior second intercostal space. And we will put our working port in. And so this is a 12 millimeter port, pretty much a second interspace mid clavicular line. The idea is to be far enough away from the uh, harvested IMA not to injure it and close enough to the target. Sometimes we'll put it in the um, third space if necessary. And this is a unique system, this air seal system that allows us to suction inside the chest uh, without losing our CO2 pressure. We're going to connect, uh, but keep the trocar inside until the system is activated. When we hear that sound and the air seal is active, we take out the, uh, the uh, trocar and uh, put a seal on it just for noise. But it is an open system, technically speaking. It's 12 millimeters, but it's not like the usual ports. It's an air seal, meaning that the uh, CO2 flow is very high to try to make up for lost CO2 if we open it up. So here we have the stabilizer able to give us some clearance. Wow. And we can see that that right lung is actually quite inherent. I mean, I pretty much routinely divide this uh, right internal mammary vein, the medial right internal mammary vein because it's uh, in the way. This is the uh, marginal branch being stabilized here. So we cauterize to expose <clears throat> the uh, target. There's a vein crossing and we need to get to the target. We have no qualms about dividing it. So now we've got a target. Put a snare around it. So the first thing we do is we put a 30 degree down scope and we go all the way down and expose as much as we can to make sure that we are indeed on the LED and not on something else. And then we correlate between what we see here and what we see on the angiogram. So here is a diagonal. We prepared the target on the back of the heart. Now we're preparing the target on the front of the heart. And here's the time where we look at our targets and we decide what size shunts we're going to be using. And in this case, I think this is a reasonably sized target. We're going to use either a 2 or a 225. So we've given our heparin. We're going to prepare the distal end of the right internal thoracic artery before we put a bulldog on it. So the first thing we do is we take a bulldog with a long string on it. And that one is going to go over to the right side.
epidural catheter to inject the pheromone up into the top of the reta. This is a standard epidural catheter that we get from our colleagues on the other side of the curtain. This catheter is special because it has holes only on the side, no holes at the tip. I wait for confirmation from Caitlin that it draws back, which she just confirmed that it does. Now we can take the whole Marita down without any issues. The cavern to the epidural catheter one more time and the Lita. So here's where we make a little opening in the anterior spinal fat. So we spatulate the uh, distal end of the uh, left IMA a little bit on stretch in this position because the heart's being pushed down by the stabilizer, but once that's done, uh, it should be better. Okay. We're uh, going to snare for real. We always announce it so that the anesthesia team knows what we're doing. These are the chase shunts that I prefer because they're soft, but they're also quite slippery. Unsnare. And we use this uh, double-armed, short 7-0 Pronova suture for the anastomosis. I like to put a shunt in the conduit in order to give it some structure and uh, avoid backwalling it. So now we're going to use this flexible midi skin uh, to check the transit time flow metry. And uh, we've got a pressure of 120, mean of 87, which is right about what we need. Now we go to the back of the heart, posteriorly, stabilizing, and we do the same thing. Concern for bleeding, we put a 32 inside the 12 millimeter port, bring it to the left chest, and we take the 24 from the left arm and put it in the right chest. <laughs> that was quite therapeutic, Qasim uh, says. Um, so, a couple of things we didn't mention on the video, and then I'll end, is that our heparin goal is an ACT of 300. Uh, the papaverin solution is 30 milligrams uh, injected in 20 cc's of normal saline, and I've been using that since forever. I was trained to do it that way in, in fellowship. Uh, we always give hydrocortisone uh, inside the OR, and we send the patients home on a, um, uh, a steroid taper for five days to prevent pericarditis, which is higher in these cases because of the CO2 than a cabbage uh, to open. The stitch is a Pronova, double armed short, about 11 centimeters long. The shunt is from Chase Medical. The outcome, uh, the patient was extubated in the OR, was discharged home the next day, and um, came back a month later uh, to get his uh, um, RCA. 
Uh, so that's it. I will stop there, and uh, we'll have more discussion about this in the in the cath lab. I think uh, in the uh, lab at the mighty, and uh, but I think that uh, the conversation is going to be centered around how do we do this in the future because uh, the old robot is going to no longer be available, and uh, the stabilizer is not there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. I, I've seen your videos many times, and I, s I still can't believe it. You, you, you're doing all this, so really, really remarkable. I think uh, our last talk is going to be uh, Dr. Mark Ruel, who's going to provide an update um, on the guidelines on stable ischemic heart disease, and he'll be joining us by Zoom to uh, give us this uh, lecture. My pleasure to be sharing and discussing with you today about cabbage in the new ACC AHA revascularization guideline, especially with regards to the stable ischemic heart disease chapter. I want to thank the Re-Evolution Committee and especially my close colleague and friend, Dr. Mahesh Ramchandani, for the kind invitation uh, to speak before you today. I have the following disclosures and we only have 20 minutes. We surely could speak well over an hour uh, about this. So the guideline was published in December 2021. Uh, and uh, the aim of the guideline was to replace the 2011 cabbage uh, guideline as well as the 2011 and 2015 PCI guidelines. As you know, uh, and you're very familiar with this, uh, there are two aspects to the tables and the recommendations. There's the strength of the recommendation or the class of recommendation, and there's the level or quality of evidence. There's not always a direct connection, for instance, between a class one recommendation and man being mandated or not by a level A uh, quality of evidence. Uh, sometimes a class one recommendation can be a level C expert opinion, and a lower recommendation can be based on randomized data. Interestingly, is the class 2B, the weaker recommendations, which can be phrased as maybe reasonable or the effectiveness is quite uncertain. So there's quite a, a wide uh, scope within the class 2B recommendation. And we'll see an example of that in the chapter 7 from the guideline. So let's jump right ahead to the uh, stable ischemic heart disease uh, chapter, which is the chapter number seven. There's a lot we, we could talk about with regards to acute coronary syndromes, bicardial rupture syndromes, the choice of conduits. But today, I think because of the limited time, we should focus on this very important chapter, the one that by far has been the most controversial. So the obvious uh, suspects are there first, and, and really no surprise there, based on the STITCH trial extension study, cabbage is indicated based on randomized data if LDEF is less than 35% in the presence of multivessel coronary artery disease. Now, based on observational data, uh, there's many series suggesting that cabbage makes sense, plus two-way recommendation, non-randomized, if the LDEF is depressed is somewhere between 35 and 50%. Cabbage meets a class one recommendation with regards to significant left main disease uh, based on randomized data, based on Excel, Noble, uh, Syntax, uh, etc. Uh, I will show you a slide, a couple of slides that may put this into question uh, that was published after the, the guideline was, um, was uh, finished, if you will. Uh, but I don't think it does. Ultimately, I think there's still an important caveat to be remembered. And the bottom line is that cabbage has a class one indication here. Now, with regards to PCI, it's a class 2A for select left main patients in whom uh, the results of PCI may be equivalent to that of cabbage. So again, a little bit of imprecise, uh, open to interpretation type of language. Now, the real caveat, uh, the one that has raised all the controversy is this class 2B and 2B indication for cabbage with regards to improving survival in patients with three vessel coronary artery disease. Uh, it's denoted as maybe reasonable. Now, in the same uh, table on multivessel coronary artery disease, PCI, again at class 2B, is denoted as uncertain 
uh, with regards to its potential to improve survival. So again, nuance within the same class of recommendation. So this 2B recommendation for cabbage really is, is at odds with anything that had been published before. And we know that what it stemmed from before was the classic 1994 uh, meta-analysis by Selim Youssef showing uh, from several trials pulled together at a patient level meta-analysis that cabbage improves survival in multivessel coronary artery disease. So the committee states that newer evidence from the ischemia trial and from meta-analyses, and we'll look at the main meta-analysis that is quoted here, led the committee after several hours of deliberation to conclude that cabbage may be reasonable to improve survival and give it a class to be recommendation. Now, as you know, this has met a significant discord in our surgical societies and even outside of our surgical societies. Uh, this is a joint statement from the AATS and STS uh, that we have uh, helped put together. Uh, the uh, Indian Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery has also issued a very well-written and interesting position statement on the guideline. And also the EX uh, has uh, submitted an open letter signed by their leadership uh, about the guideline, as did the late Latin America Association for Cardiac and Endovascular Surgery. And finally, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, which I preside, got together a number of uh, uh, cardiologists, surgeons, even cardiac anesthesiologists, rehab specialists, to indicate that the guideline really missed the goal and provide a detailed analysis around that. So really a lot of a lot of controversy around this guideline, but where does it stem from? Rather than complaining only, I think it's important that we as surgeons know really where the problem is and how can we criticize uh, the decision that the guideline committee did. And we all know that it was not unanimous at the, at the end of the day. Uh, so ultimately, what does the patient need? Uh, what do these patients uh, require? And how can we interpret the literature that applies to them? So let's go to the stem of what has been essentially the mover and shaker uh, leading to this new guideline, the ischemia trial. So ischemia was a trial comparing an initial conservative strategy versus an initial invasive strategy in patients with significant ischemia from multivessel coronary artery disease, no left main coronary stenosis, and who were essentially randomized towards getting an angiogram and a stream towards revascularization versus waiting to receive that. Once the initial allocation had taken place, then patients could basically go as needed clinically. It was not technically a clinical trial crossover. So over 5,000 patients took part in this chemia trial in 37 countries of 320 sites. The mean age was 64 years old, which is very uh, average, if you will, no pun intended, for a revascularization trial, and 77% of patients were diabetic, uh, were male, 42% were diabetics, and 3.2 years was the median follow-up of the trial. Um, the primary outcome was the composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or hospitalization for angina, CHF, or cardiac arrest. Now, the figure before you is probably the more important one. It's the death rate at five years. It was 9% with the invasive strategy and 8.3% with the conservative strategy for no difference uh, ultimately. So ischemia got interpreted. Remember again what the randomization was about. It was not PCI or surgery versus medications. It was what was performed initially. Can you wait before you send them to an angiogram versus send them to an angiogram right away? Nevertheless, it got interpreted here even in this specialized literature as PCI and surgery strike out versus medications. Or the New York Times saying that a large federal study on bypass surgeries and stents questions the medical care provided to tens of thousands of heart disease patients. Uh, the meta-analysis that was quoted by the writing committee for the guideline is this one as well, by Sripal Bangalore, who was one of the authors of the guideline statement as well. Uh, this meta-analysis was published about almost two years ago in circulation. It included 14 trials, almost 15,000 patients, 
but those trials will not be very familiar to you because many, the, most, the vast majority of those trials did not provide cabbage uh, to, to their patients. Only 16% of the patients in this meta-analysis had undergone cabbage. And essentially, as we know, in stable ischemic heart disease, based on the Courage study, based on Barry 2D, based on Orbita, based on many other trials, essentially, even FAME trials, if you will, uh, the FAME 2 trial, the heart outcomes in stable ischemic heart disease are not improved by PCI. So this is not su surprising that when you do a patient level pool meta-analysis of 14 trials that very overwhelmingly compared PCI to medical therapy, you don't see a difference. As you can see here, the hazard ratio for death is 0.99 with revascularization versus medical therapy. So the authors concluded that routine revascularization was not associated with improved survival in patients with stable ischemic heart disease. What they should have said, however, this was not revascularization as a whole. This was PCI and only 16% of patients in the randomized group, so less about 8% or so of the overall patients had received a cabbage. Let's get back to ischemia. The key messages, the need to know uh, tidbits, if you will, from ischemia is that ischemia did not compare cabbage to medical therapy. You could even argue, if you wanted, that it did not compare PCI to medical therapy. But even more so, it did not compare cabbage to medical therapy. And as a result, if you overinterpret and, and you miss the key message of ischemia, it can be dangerous to miss indications for cabbage. And probably what comes out of ischemia is that a medical therapy expert, preferably one who understands the nuance of the trial, of the ischemia trial, should serve on heart team. The lead PI of ischemia herself has been reportedly saying that people don't understand ischemia whatsoever. And is it my fault if people cannot read the trial? Yet it's gone in all directions and even led to a change in the guideline leading, leading to invalidating previous solid evidence showing a survival benefit for cabbage in multivessel coronary artery disease. So more caveats that you can discuss with your colleagues with regards to ischemia. In the invasive group, 20% of patients only had cabbage. In fact, there were more patients who had medical therapy alone in the invasive strategy group of ischemia than who had cabbage, and PCI was 59%. That being said, remember the 42% diabetics that I had mentioned before, and there was multivessel coronary artery disease in 71% of patients, including three-vessel disease in 40% of patients. So one could argue that cabbage was likely underutilized. If you look at diabetic patients with multivessel disease, these patients should have received cabbage, and it's only 20% overall who did so. Yet there were 42% of diabetics, 71% multivessel disease, and 40% three-vessel disease. It's hard to know where the groups intersect exactly. That data is not available, but I can probably plausibly affirm or assert that cabbage was underutilized in this case. So very importantly, however, I want to re-emphasize this. There were less patients in ischemia in the invasive strategy group who received cabbage than who received medical therapy in invasive group. And even more, there were more patients in the conservative group who received revascularization than who received cabbage in the invasive strategy. So again, extreme dilution of groups, which makes no sense. You cannot assert that ischemia was medical therapy versus especially bypass surgery. As I said before, 42% had diabetes, 71% had multivessel CED, yet cabbage was utilized only 20% of the time. Interestingly, the overall effects of diabetes or severe coronary artery disease in ischemia were quite dire. Here, this shows you the hazard ratio for patients with three vessel disease or two vessel disease with proximal LAD stenosis. Hazard ratio of 2.3 with the ischemia intervention. Again, no difference between conservative or invasive, but whatever that intervention of ischemia was, it didn't work. Patients were 2.5 times more likely to die if they had multivessel disease in ischemia. So again, suggesting that cabbage was underutilized. What the tool that we have, that we've had for several decades 
to treat multivessel coronary artery disease. Did not work. And I want to remind you, this was after adjustment for other comorbidities, such as uh, ischemia severity, age, sex, region, diabetes, hypertension, current smoking, prior MI, et cetera. You have it right in front of you. So this is the intrinsic effect of this on revascular rise, unaddressed coronary artery disease severity. Same thing for diabetes. The overall hazard ratio was 1.5, just from being diabetic, despite adjustment from, for everything else. Again, suggesting that the effective tool, the only effective tool, i.e. cabbage, was underutilized in ischemia. So invasive management, the invasive strategy did not lower all-cause mortality at four years in any ischemia scrub group, in any coronary artery disease severity, or in the presence of diabetes. So what this feed that tells me is that that intervention was not an effective one. It was not a cabbage intervention. You could even argue that it was not purely a PCI intervention. It was waiting versus not waiting. And unfortunately, because of that, many patients probably did not receive the treatment that they should have had with multi vessel CAD or with diabetes. So are we back to the 1970s? Are we going to use these conclusions to proferate that there's no role with coronary revascularization anymore? I think we have to be very, very careful with that. And when we read that PCI and surgery strike up versus meds, let's ask ourselves, does this make sense? Does it sound right? Does it look right? And arguably it doesn't. Let's get back to the old evidence, the one that got dismissed because of ischemia. Essentially not a lot of recent trials. These old trials were from the 80s and 90s, but they were so overwhelmingly um, in favor of cabbage that they were not redone. Essentially the only more recent trial since is Stitch, which was on a specific subgroup of LV dysfunction patients with less than 35% ejection fraction, and MAS2, which was continued over time and also showed a benefit towards cabbage. There's no more recent trial of optimal medical therapy versus cabbage. Now, some will argue that ischemia is that trial, and I think hopefully you agree that this is not the case. Ischemia was not a trial of medical therapy versus cabbage. Again, the overwhelming effects here of cabbage's medical therapy at five years and at 10 years in all patients, essentially in the patient level metanalysis from USIF from 1994. Encourage, in counterpart, PCI does not make any difference with regards to survival in, uh, versus optimal medical therapy in stable ischemic heart disease. So PCI is no better than optimal medical therapy. Excel, again, these are left main disease patients. This is not the two B indications we're talking about. But again, a strong survival benefit for cabbage over PCI in this subpopulation. Yet in ischemia, with this dilution of effect, would suggest that cabbage has no role. I think we have to be very, very careful. And I would invite you to read this in more detail uh, with some of the pieces that I'll suggest to you. Again, the correct interpretation of ischemia, it's a strategy of waiting to perform coronary angiography in patients with moderate to severe ischemia is as good as proceeding right away with it at 3.2 years of follow-up. It's not PCI and surgery strike out versus meds. We let's remember patients were moved from one strategy to another, also based on perceptions from that era. Will new knowledge that we now have, even a new guideline, impact the safe applicability of this initially conservative strategy, which in fact did not even work because we see the results in three vessel disease and in diabetes and patients, I'm sorry to say, have been dropping like flies. So what if an indication, especially now with the new guideline for cabbage in a good candidate is overlooked or dismissed? So I think we have to be very, very careful and I'll skip on this slide. So overall ischemia is not a trial of revascularization versus medical therapy. It's even less a trial of cabbage versus medical therapy as cabbage was very likely underutilized. The controls, even to the rare patients who had cabbage due to severe CAD cannot by design be produced by ischemia. So I fear this paper is gonna come out soon. It's gonna be CT-based severity of coronary artery disease, case matching patients who had cabbage versus those who didn't have cabbage. Well, you can't, CT scan cannot provide you that information. You need an angiogram in order to have a syntax score, in order to assess disease diffuseness in a reliable manner. So the control to the few patients, the control patients to the few who had cabbage cannot be produced at any point in time 
uh, in the schema child. And as I said before, whatever that diluted invasive intervention was, it failed to curtail the effects of coronary artery disease severity or diabetes on mortality and others. One could argue, therefore, that the inter intervention of ischemia was grossly ineffective and therefore not, not the right one. I'll leave you with an example. Imagine I want to do a meningococcemia trial in 10-year-old children of lumbar puncture plus or minus antibiotics versus initially conservative strategy for kids, 10-year-olds presenting with neck stiffness and fever. So again, my intervention here is there's not going to be a lumbar puncture initially versus we're going to go straight to lumbar puncture. And if the lumbar puncture is positive, we're going to give antibiotics. And in my trial, the kid can get a lumbar puncture and antibiotics later at any time once the initial allocation has been respected. For instance, if the kid fails to improve clinically. If I were to show you with this trial that there's no difference at the end between the initial invasive versus conservative groups, have I proven to you that we've shown that antibiotics have no effect, no benefit in treating meningococcemia? Well, no, you're saying this doesn't make sense. This is not what the trial was about. Well, I think this trial is exactly what ischemia was designed to show or not show, you could argue, with regards to revascularization, even more cabbage in severe coronary artery disease. And yet, the world believes that now cabbage has no role because of a similarly designed trial dealing with severe coronary artery disease. So the guidelines should not have allocated their class to be recommended recommendation with regards to survival and loss plus CAD. The old evidence that we had has not been invalidated by this team. It should have given a class one indication for cabbage over PCI and diabetes and multivessel CAD with regards to survival and major adverse cardiac events. That's based on freedom and barrier 2D. I didn't show you that evidence today. It's beyond the scope of the limited time that we have. And it should also have given a class one recommendation for cabbage over optimal medical therapy for MACE and class two way for survival based on very 2D trial over medical therapy in patients with diabetes. So a couple of trials before uh, I let you go. First, the FAME-3 trial, which uh, to everyone's surprise was negative, was essentially inferior for PCI at one year. The non-inferior margin was not met, if you will. And, and very interestingly, uh, in all subgroups, there was a uh, numerical advantage for cabbage, except in patients with a low syntax score, which may have been just the effect of chance, but it's certainly a lot of PCI specialists are holding on to this to see if perhaps it'll turn out to be significant effect modification, if you will. But already at one year, there's a signal with regards to increased death rates when the PCI versus the cabbage group, 1.7 is the hazard ratio. MI, 50% increase, 1.5 hazard ratio. And I want to give a kudos to all cabbage specialists around the world. Stroke rate at one year with cabbage, 1.1%. Death rate at one year, not perioc, 0.9% as well. Wonderful results. Essentially, death by or stroke, 40% higher with PCI than cabbage at one year. The other paper that I want to leave you with is the recent Sabatine meta-analysis of several trials, including Syntax Noble Excel uh, of left main coronary artery disease, comparing PCI versus cabbage. Now, it showed that there was no significant difference with regards to using PCI versus cabbage in those patients. The stroke rate was the same. Repeat revascularization and MI was worse for PCI, but overall, stroke and survival were the same. But look at this very important figure from the paper. Figure three is where the entire reason, the entire understanding of the paper lies, in my opinion. If you look at this forest plot, you will see that many patients, almost more than a third, 40, 45% of patients, almost a thousand per group, out of um, shy of 5,000, were in an acute coronary syndrome. And those patients were the ones who drove neutrality between PCR versus cabbage. If you look here at the patients who were in a stable ischemic heart disease type of setting, the overwhelming effect of cabbage for left main disease over PCI is again proven 
with a hazard ratio of 1.38 for PCI versus cabbage with regards to survival. Again, 38% more chances that someone will die if they get PCI versus cabbage for their life. So um, there will be more effect modifiers. I think that we have to understand the effect of sex, uh, chronic uh, total occlusion, uh, physical functioning. Stay tuned. There's an excellent article coming out circulation in the next couple of months about this, uh, which will really help determine in a precision medicine environment uh, when we should do cabbage, i.e. in patients who have, who have good mental and physical functioning versus doing PCI, i.e. in patients who don't function well, will not be able to recover, and frankly, will not derive a benefit from cabbage. If you want more details, I would invite you to consult those papers, and I will also invite you, compel you, to come to the very first Society of Thoracic Surgeons Coronary Conference, which will be held in Ottawa, a beautiful city, especially beautiful in June, from June 3rd to June 5, 2022. So I hope to see you in Ottawa at our STS Coronary Conference. And on this, I want to thank you all for your wonderful attention and, and your attendance at this prime meeting, Re-Evolution. Again, my thanks to Dr. Ram Shandani and the organizers of Re-Evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for a fantastic uh, review of the guidelines, ischemia, and I think it's really important that we as surgeons understand this data well and, and, and understand it and the strengths and limitations of it. We're a little bit behind schedule, but maybe what we can do is um, do 15 minutes or so with everybody up on the podium for a little bit of Q&A, and, you know, I, as I said, I think the data is really important, but at the end of the day, I'd like to bring it back a little bit to the practical aspects and see if the audience has any questions about how to do minimal invasive cabbage and, and bring us back to that. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. And can we get the audio response uh, system up? Do we still have that? Thank you. Thank you all for wonderful presentations, and thank you, Mark, for uh, uh, being present and giving us your, uh, uh, your views on this very important recent uh, uh, controversial guideline update. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to kick it off by asking the panel uh, what their views are on uh, hybrid coronary revascularization, certainly in our institution and many others because of the fact that we lack randomized uh, controlled trial and robust evidence to support it, there is some reluctance to uh, embark on that route. And uh, we're sort of slowly overcoming it. I get the sense that Fran in his institution a long time ago uh, uh, was able to overcome that hurdle. But I'd like to know uh, what your views are. So uh, I think it's uh, highly institution dependent. Mahesh, it's, uh, uh, I think that uh, when cardiologists start to see the results of that can be achieved with less invasive surgery, um, they're uh, more likely to come on, come on board. It's an evolution in a program. Um, and, you know, I, I, my experience has been that it's generally with those cardiologists that uh, tend to be leaders in their in the institution. Um, these are the ones that uh, you know are uh, uh, many of the others in their practice are looking to for the difficult case that sort of thing. And I think they tend to be more open to these sorts of uh, applications. And then once they see this, then I think they become real advocates for um, managing uh, patients with more arrows in their quiver. The reverse hybrid that Fran's talking about, the, um, uh, those sorts of things, uh, particularly as our patient populations become more and more complex. Um, I'll add, uh, I, 
Uh, our experience is that uh, the number of hybrids, the percentage is about what Fran has in the 40, low 40 percent range. And um, I think uh, once the, the interventional cardiologists realize that they have a, a reliable and durable uh, mechanism to get a lemma on the LAD without a sternotomy, they flock to hybrid, you know, um, evidence be damned because that is something that they truly believe in, in my experience. And then you add to that the possibility of putting a second IMA, then they really open up the indications. Um, so if, and, and I think it's very uh, institution specific in that if you, if you get a fax machine, you will receive faxes. And if you do a less invasive Lima LED, you will see a lot of hybrids. It seems a lot of questions. Uh, from the audience on multi-arterial grafting, configurations, which grafts to use. Uh. Oh. Yep. So um, for bilateral IMAs, it depends actually mostly of um, how old is the patient and what's the probability in the future that he needs a reintervention in the heart. Um, um, generally, what we do, like in, I would say, 70% of cases, we do uh, Rima to LED and Lima to a left side target. But if we are concerned, we have concerns about um, uh, the future need of reintervention, then we can usually do a T graph or a Y graph. But this is the only configuration we use so far. S Sam, what you do is really, really advanced, and it's fascinating. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, do you think there is a role for doing what you do, but go on pump, even cross clamp? Um, do you think it defeats the purpose then? Um, mm -hmm. Especially with the stabilizer not being available anymore, I think the beaver blade also is going away. What, what do you think is a good way for people to move towards T-cap, because you have mastered this, but for someone sitting in the audience, you know, seeing this for the first time, it seems like a very long road to go from learn just how to do anything minimal invasively to going to T-cap. Mm. Well, I think the, uh, the steps are pretty clear. I think you have to master beating heart surgery, off-pump bypass in an open setting in a comfort zone with shunts, understanding the difference between an arrested heart coronary bypass procedure and an off-pump bypass procedure in terms of communication with anesthesia and, um, and, and all those things that go along with it. The second thing then you have to master is how do you do single lung ventilation, uh, understanding CO2 uh, in the chest and all the implications of that, and then having um, you know, a bandwidth that allows you to input all of that. Because the easiest thing to do is you know, open the chest, go on pump, cross clamp, put your head down, and so, and we do that very well, we do it fast, and we don't have to talk to anybody maybe not even our first assistant. But the other paradigm, which is the other extreme of that, is you have to keep all those other things in mind. Um, and so to answer your question, Johannes Bonatti is not here, and, and he will tell you that there is a huge role for a rested heart TCAB, and, and he practices that. And I think Sloan Guy, uh, who uh, is on the faculty here, has done uh, a bunch of those. I have not. We use the endo balloon as a matter of routine for our mitral surgeries, and I think if you have z zero potential for complications in the femoral cannulation area, i.e., it's not a, you know, elderly, frail person with severe PVD, peripheral vascular disease, then it's not unreasonable to cannulate the groin um, and and stop the heart if you need to, or just do a beating heart on pump procedure. Um, stabilization is really the name of the game for TCAB, and that is a hurdle that we need to address collectively between us and industry for the robotic systems. Now, the good news is that there are new robotic systems that are coming up that might, um, g you know, we, we might be able to catch their ear in terms of supporting us, but um, it's a work in progress. Fran, you've done um, off-comp couch for a long time, and, you know, you, you started when it became a hype, and then it was the big rave, and then data sort of did it in a little bit. And, you know, some of the surgeons may be at institutions where there's a pushback against off-pump cabbage in general. What's your, um, what advice can you give for people who want to embark on this? Because I think it's pretty clear that if you want to do minimal invasive, for, for the most part, it will mean you have to do off-pump cabbage. I, I think that we have very sophisticated flow gadgets, and they work well. And if you use them, then you should be able to do off-pump and be able to 
check your grafts and know that they're fine. There is a little bit more finesse in moving the heart. You have to have an anesthesia person that can work with you, so it makes it a little bit more complicated, but uh, all of it is doable and very <coughs> which you eliminate the heart lung machine, the bleeding, <coughs> the bleeding and everything else that goes with it. For, for people who do hybrid, or all of you, how do you stay trained? What comes first? What comes second? For a hybrid? Yeah. Well, 40 Maybe we're just going to go down the row and everybody can comment. 40% of my, my hybrids, they do PCI first. They come in with acute coronary system, or, you know, and then uh, they do their PCI, and they're very happy when I say, I'll be glad to do the robot after you loaded them with Plavix. And we just do the case. The, the robot is that accurate. Um, and you can't have blood in your field that you're going after every little blood cell that you see because it, it clouds everything. And I showed you our data. There was, you know, less than 1% difference between those on dual antiplatelet therapy and those without dual antiplatelet therapy. So uh, I, it's a sales thing to the cardiologist. They, they love that. And then if they, you know, when they're on the Effian or Berlinta, then uh, I still have ended up doing them. I don't like it. So if I have a relatively elective patient that had a stent, you know, at some point, even in the year before, I'll still leave them on the Plavix. But if they're on the other medicines, I'll say, okay, well, let's transition them to Plavix. I'll feel more comfortable. Steve? Yeah, that, so just to uh, manage the last comment first, that's actually the uh, protocol that we used uh, to enroll patients in the uh, uh, hybrid trial. Um, uh, the discussion among interventionalists and surgeons was um, it was uh, not prohibitively uh, unsafe to m manage patients, uh, transition patients to Plavix and then operate on, on Plavix. Um, so that's what we've been doing for a long, long time. And I agree with Fran that the additional bleeding risk is negligible. Um, again, we've had, you know, I think as the, the program matures, um, you find more and more opportunities to utilize uh, a hybrid approach. And so, as Fran said, the reverse hybrid becomes a relatively common occurrence. Um, we started our uh, work down that road with same day hybrids and hybrid OR. Um, and uh, so it was uh, memory of LED first and then completion arteriogram and um, non LED stents the same at the same setting. Um, that works great if you have a hybrid room, but if you do not, then um, you know, we've seen everything um, around the country, you know, moving patients from room to room. Uh, same hospitalization, different day, revascularization. I think there's just, um, it, it ends, it, some of it's driven by uh, availability of technology and some of it's driven by practice styles. So a lot of options. Yeah, at UCSF we do not, <coughs> regarding dual antiplatelet therapy, we do not hold off Plavix, uh, uh, them uh, adapt for, um, before doing the hybrid strategy for the surgery, surgical part. And um, uh, on which comes first depend on a few things. Like, first of all, what is the tightest lesion? Because sometimes like, if you have like LED, OM, and a very tight lesion on the right side, sometimes uh, we prefer to PCI first the right side and go to, um, to the OR to do the, the extended or advanced uh, um, hybrid using bilateral MEMS for the other targets. And sometimes when the LED is the culprit lesion, uh, it's the tightest lesion, then we do the lean to LED first, and then PCI the rest after that. So uh, it depends on case-by-case -case basis. There's no specific rule. Um, I, I would agree with all of that. Our incidence of reverse hybrid, which PCI first, is pretty low compared to what Fran quoted. It's probably 10%. Um, we have been burned uh, a couple of times by uh, doing the surgery first and then following with the PCI and the PCI was not successful. 
and uh, so we were left with incomplete revascularization. Um, and we've uh, published on residual syntax scores after hybrid advanced um, revascularization and actually noticed that there was a little bit of a difference in, in our um, outcomes when the PCI was unsuccessful. So we're very cognizant when we have the discussion with the cardiologist, what's your likelihood of being able to fix this? Because we do a lot of CTOs to the right coronary that way, and if there's any question, we say, you go first, and if you can't get it, then we change our strategy. Um, but otherwise, the majority are surgery first, PCI later. All really great insights, and I think I'm gonna give the last word to Mark Rell maybe comment on, you know, hybrid revascularization, your, your perspective on things, where we stand with it. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. It's so, so good to be amongst friends, and, and I know the uh, audience and the faculty and trainees are, are already enjoying this meeting, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, a couple of unsolicited thoughts, and thank you for the, the short uh, opportunity to comment. Uh, hybrid, I think uh, there's data coming out now. We see it at, on meeting platforms. Uh, I think we'll have to expect uh, a slightly higher rate of repeat revascularization. I think that is universally seen. Uh, it's usually, uh, thank God, uh, due to the uh, non lethal LED territories. But uh, I think we will see that and it's very much in line with what we see when we compare PCI versus cabbage, even in non LED territories. Uh, the second comment I would have is, you know, to echo what has been said around off-pump surgery. Uh, I tell our trainees, this is no way you can take this operation well into the 21st century if you don't do off-pump surgery and if you're not a master at it. Sure, there may be controversies around Ruby, but we, we know what this stems from. And if we don't bring the field forward, the field will be extinct. And much to our surprise, as we've seen in the last couple of years, it's not going to come from PCI. It's going to come from medical therapy, which is perceived wrongly so. Uh, to have obliterated the need to perform cabbage. And it's not PCI who's a direct competitor now. It's people thinking that any form of surgery is wrong and we should never revascularize these patients. And as I said in my presentation earlier, with in some way back to the 1970s with people dropping like flies because of multivessel coronary disease, especially when they have diabetes as well. And, and the last thing I would say is a bit of a word of caution around reverse hybrid. I think you have to really know what your institution does. I have seen some of these patients die with perfect non-sternotomy, two mammaries on the left heart, someone who came in in an acute coronary syndrome. The, the last one, Mr. S, was three years ago, and I remember him like yesterday, and I will never do that again. Uh, depending on your institution, even if you continue that, and even if you load them, stents do not like surgery, stents do not like heparin followed by protamine. You may choose to not give protamine, I've done that too, but I'm still very wary of occasional events, and I tell my faculty members, and I say, if you're going within six weeks into a stented artery that's a major artery, you graft that artery, or you wait six weeks. Um, I know this is not a universal experience, it may be center dependent, but I would like to provide a word of caution around that. One has to be really careful, and stent thrombosis, as you all know, is lethal. The mortality of a stent going down is 40-50%. It's not like a graph going down where it's sub 1%. And that's why I can't stand comparisons in table twos of papers comparing graph failure versus stent thrombosis. They're absolutely, they are not at all the same paradigm. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to, to comment and uh, I hope you have a great meeting. Thank you so much, Mark. Really great thoughts. Um, I think we could go on for hours, but I think in the interest of time, um, we'll break for 10 minutes and come back at 10.30. I think this was a fantastic session. I would like to thank all the speakers for fantastic talks and a good conversation. So see you back at 10.30. Thank you. thank you all. If you could grab some coffee and come back. Uh, we actually have the luxury of some extra time today because we don't have a scheduled talk at lunchtime. But we absolutely do want to start the lab on time at 1. So uh, thank you again. Goodbye.
Okay, so welcome back everyone. We're gonna start our last uh, session like for this morning before we go to the lab. It, it will be a very like an exciting lab this afternoon with great setup again. So I would like to invite Dr. William Kent to start the first talk of this morning, which, uh, which is about uh, minimally invasive uh, aortic valve replacement uh, through right anterior thoracotomy. Great. Um, welcome back. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, attend. Uh, this is my first time in Houston, first time at this meeting, and uh, very well organized, and certainly appreciate uh, the, the invitation to be here. So I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, right anterior mini thoracotomy approach for aortic valve replacement. Now the uh, you know, simple outline, I only want to accomplish two things here this morning. One is to talk a bit about the technique, uh, which I think is a, a technique achievable for all, all surgeons, and, and we should really be doing more of this uh, operation. And secondly, the question I get asked, well, well by, why bother doing this approach? Is there a real benefit to this? So, um, you know, we have a lot of discussion about uh, uh, TAVR versus AVR, surgical AVR versus, versus TAVR. And, uh, you know, in Canada, where I practice, certainly um, we haven't uh, seen the uh, TAVR resurgence to the degree that it is in, in the U.S. So there's, um, uh, you know, we're still doing a lot of surgical AVR. But, you know, something that's maybe missed in the discussion is, is what about minimally invasive AVR? That's uh, not as much part of the, uh, the discussion, and I, th I think it should be. Um, we don't do a lot of minimally invasive AVR. According to the STS database, about 23% of surgical AVRs are done uh, minimally invasive, and the majority of those are upper hemisternotomy. Only 7% are right anterior mini thoracotomy, and I think if we want to realize the true benefit of minimally invasive AVR, that's the approach that we should be using. So let's talk a bit about uh, the, the RAMT approach. Uh, it is a sternum sparing technique, and I think that's as it, its advantage. I think the uh, a sternotomy is a sternotomy, and uh, you, you um, gain significant benefit from taking a thoracotomy approach for these patients. Uh, Preoperatively, um, I think, uh, you know, this is um, a matter of some debate, but I think uh, CT is uh, essential for preoperative planning. I think it lets us assess the aorta, plan the incision. Uh, also, if we're doing percutaneous cannulation, I think imaging the, the femorals is, uh, is key. I think uh, there are situations that are done better for me. Uh, I'm not a, a, a transcatheter valve uh, surgeon. I don't have as much experience with percutaneous uh, cannulation. I don't use it in the, in the patients that are higher risk for groin wound complications or, or percutaneous cannulation uh, complications, I should say. Uh, if it's deeper than five centimeters, if there's anterior calcium, uh, sh a short common femoral, or uh, a small femoral, I, I avoid uh, percutaneous and do uh, cut down. Uh, use a single lumen endotracheal tube, uh, no PA catheter, lift the right shoulder up a little bit uh, with the arm tucked in R2 pads. Uh, cannulation is done in the right femoral artery and vein. Uh, again, I think uh, using the CT scan can help you a lot planning this operation and can make things a lot easier. There are some that are more challenging than others and a technique that uh, we found uh, useful in Calgary is to draw a line perpendicular to the aortic valve, five centimeters, and then look at what inner space is closest to that. Sometimes it's the third, usually it's the uh, second inner space, and that's very helpful. Sometimes you have people that have a longer ascending aorta, and the third inner space certainly gives you better uh, visualization. Usually it's second. Uh, another uh, uh, finding on CT that's particularly relevant, there are some cases that uh, need to be converted to open, and uh, we've learned that in our experience. These would be the ones. The ones that the aorta is right underneath the sternum, uh, those are uh, very high risk for uh, conversion and avoid those. Um, let's uh, talk a bit about the uh, operation itself. The, the setup is anti-grade delnido cardioplegia. At our center, uh, a drop sucker rather than an LV vent, uh, CO2 through a five centimeter incision in the second inner space. Uh, cannulation, uh, my fallback, and what I've done with the majority of my patients is a small cut down. 
uh, with a 25 venous in almost all patients. And uh, I have not had a patient that, I, that cannot be adequately drained with a 25 venous cannula and a 17 or 19 French arterial, depending on body surface area. The, um, uh, the key to minimally invasive surgery, I think, is drainage. You really, really have to get good drainage. And that's a bit on placement, cannula, cannula selection. I think you can get a 25 in any, any patient and achieve that. Um, it, I, uh, it is important to drain the SVC. Uh, I don't do a separate uh, drainage of the SVC in, in, uh, in mitral's or aortics, but you got to get the cannula far enough up into the SVC, and the cannula is advanced uh, as far as I possibly can. And when you achieve that with a multi-side port venous cannula, you're going to have you're going to have great, great drainage, and that's uh, that's certainly important. Uh, let's uh, go through a video here. So. The, um, the approach in, in this video will be uh, second interspace. I think um, uh, early on in the experience, I, I would uh, divide the third rib and take the internal thoracic artery. No longer do that. I think that uh, in the large majority of patients, uh, that's not required. You can, it's, it's um, uh, helpful maybe in patients where exposure is challenging, but in the large majority, you can preserve the uh, the mammary, and um, that uh, reduces your risk of bleeding, certainly. That's, that's uh, you know, really the only spot you're going to have to worry about bleeding is when you clip and divide those uh, vessels. Uh, a soft tissue retractor, um, of course, facilitates your exposure. I, I do use a retractor. Some, some uh, uh, surgeons avoid a retractor. I try to gently spread the ribs. and. Unlike the mitral, I find pain with this uh, operation is much, much less, and uh, uh, pain control is not a challenge. Uh, using a port is um, helpful for placing the uh, drop sucker through that. Out of all the tips I've been given as I learned this operation, this is the most important. I think bringing the traction sutures outside laterally in the chest wall really brings the aorta over to you. And there's very few aortas that you have challenging exposure. It brings it right into the incision um, and uh, allows you to um, uh, get excellent exposure to the ascending aorta. Anti-grade delnido cardioplegia is given. Uh, I'll give osteal, of course, if uh, in the cases of severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, good, um, good visualization of the, of the, of the annulus. Now, you know, this operation is certainly facilitated by valve technology, and I think rapid deployment and sutureless valves are really helpful early on in experience. They're much straight, more straightforward and simple to place. In this video, as a uh, Intuity valve was placed, the majority of uh, our series in Calgary is uh, Percival. It's about 50% of Percival valves in uh, elderly patients, so I think it's a really good option. Um, but as you gain experience, you realize you can absolutely place any valve. So a lot of uh, onyx valves or, or sutured valves, I mean, the exposure is just fine for that once you get comfortable with the exposure. And um, uh, it, when you do use a uh, mechanical valve or a stented valve, uh, a coronite is, is certainly of benefit. Um, uh, there, there's um, many reports in the literature that this approach is associated with longer cross clamp times. This certainly levels the playing field when you use rapid deployment or a, a sutureless valve. Um, in this case, uh, I took the, the uh, delivery device off and placed the drop sucker through the Intuity. Uh, that actually allows you to look through that little hole and, and verify that the, the stainless steel stent is down below the annulus too. So it gives you the option of, uh, you know, passing the vent and then confirming the, the position is correct. So, and then the three sutures are tied, of course, in the case of the uh, Intuity with a, uh, with a knot pusher. And you, you can certainly use a knot pusher for a, a, a sutured valve uh, or a stented valve, but it's uh, a core nut, certainly, certainly great help. Um, in terms of cross clamp, there's a chitwood cross clamp in this case. Uh, the other clamp, I think, is, uh, is highly effective is the Glauber clamp, but really, I mean, whatever, whatever you choose uh, is uh, reasonable in this setting. And uh, pacer wire, 
pacer wires are maybe one of the more challenging uh, things to learn. Uh, I used to put it on the undersurface of the RV. Pretty hard to get that access. So uh, now placing it on the RVOT is is a much simpler option, and uh, you know that becomes a, a, a not a difficult thing to do if you do it before the cross clamp is off. Small incision, uh, you know, cosmesis. Some would suggest that that's not all that uh, important, but yeah, it really is to some patients, and I think we, we shouldn't be dismissive of that. So what are the benefits? And this is what I get asked by my colleagues. When, when we started doing, uh, in 2016, started doing right anterior mini thoracotomy in, in Calgary, uh, we have expanded the program now. It's, it's a three surgeon experience. The large majority of isolated AVR in Calgary uh, is done with a right anterior mini thoracotomy. And my, my colleagues have been convinced of its benefits. I think um, there's a, you know, there's not great literature on this, as you, as you know. It's uh, a lot of uh, cohorts, um, uh, single center cohort studies. So maybe what we look to the most is we should look at uh, meta-analyses, and those would suggest that when you look at right anterior mini thoracotomy versus conventional AVR, it may take a little longer at first, certainly. I think that that can be mitigated as you gain, as you gain experience with it. Uh, but what is consistently shown is less atrial fibrillation, shorter length of stay. Um, looking at STS database, uh, you know, this is real world experience, so I think this is also valuable data that we can look at. Again, demonstrating longer cross clamp and, and bypass times, uh, favorable, comparable uh, mortality and stroke in, in real world series in STS. Um, again, less AFib, less uh, transfusion less renal failure and shorter length of stay. So this, these are consistent findings, and I think that uh, you know, addressing the, the, uh, the, the longer cross clamp, and, and uh, we, should, we should embrace these technologies as surgeons. I certainly believe, believe in them myself, and I think there's, there's good evidence that these valves are, are, are a great option for some patients. They do help to facilitate uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery, tend to have lower gradients. Uh, shorten your cross clamp, and they're certainly better for small roots with, uh, without a stent and the risk of PPM. Now, our experience in Calgary, this is uh, one of my um, uh, residents published our series on, the, on our, our first uh, 100 cases. Now, these, these, to be honest with you, we've got a little lot. Uh, we've now got about 250, and we'll be publishing that compared to conventional AVR. Uh, our pacemaker rate's a little higher, and those are uh, largely XL Percival's actually that accounted for it. Uh, it's now about four and a, four and a half for uh, for pace, pacemaker. Um, minimal mortality. There's three conversions in 250 now. Uh, re, really, really low blood transfusion. I think that's such a benefit with this approach. Uh, really low risk of uh, of uh, blood transfusion and take backs. The pain is very minimal with. Uh, uh, not a lot of narcotic requirements, which we uh, quantified. Now, one of the other things is, as we're looking for benefits of minimally invasive surgery and right anterior mini thoracotomy approaches, um, you know, one of my uh, residents very interested in looking at the pericardium and what's going on in the pericardium after surgery, looking at inflammatory mediators in, in the pericardium, comparing open cases with mini thoracotomy cases and finding there's certainly less evidence of inflammation within the pericardium. And if you've ever operated on one of these patients on a redo, there's almost no adhesions. And so when you look at that uh, drain output, inflammatory markers, neutrophils, interleukin-1, MMP, and, and TNF-alpha, lower, lower in these uh, patients when you sample it postoperatively. So what are the, what are the uh, consequences of that? Well, we may see uh, less, less AFib. Maybe that's a contributor to seeing less AFib in these patients, which is a con consistent finding across uh, studies that we're, we're seeing. Uh, pericarditis, maybe less pericardial uh, pain, adhesion formation, uh, may even affect uh, RV function, which is a signal towards that as well. So that's important, and, the, and really we have to look at the functional outcome of these patients to see the real benefit. If we're looking at the quantitative you know, stroke risk, mortality, we're not going to really uh, realize the benefits of, of this approach relative to conventional AVR. But these are things that are important. You know, people are, are hiking at two weeks post-op. I had an anesthesiologist back at work in nine days. So this, this functional outcome is, is really important. I think that's what we have to focus on. Uh, I think we need to look at pain, patient satisfaction, mobility, how quickly they get back to work, return to activity, and, and the cosmesis as well. 
This has been looked a little bit. I think we have to do a better job at sort of examining these qualitative outcomes. Uh, but if we look at this, this is uh, the Evolute Low Risk Trials suggesting that right anterior mini thoracotomy in terms of uh, 30 day uh, quality of life outcomes is more equivalent to TAVI than it is the other surgical approaches. Uh, so in conclusion, I think the, the uh, right anterior mini thoracotomy technique is ideal for isolated AVR. I think we should do more of it as a, as a group of surgeons. It can be used for both mechanical and biological valves. It's, uh, it becomes a, a versatile technique that way. Uh, the benefits, and I think these are uh, becoming more evident, to less bleeding, less AFib, shorter length of stay, improved quality of life, certainly important to our patients, and we've got to pay attention to that. Less pain, better mobility. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Dr. Kent, thank you so much. This, this is really a great presentation. It's one of the presentations that you don't want to blink for a second, you know. Thank and you. just to tell you, we have the right to keep the slides. So we need, <laughs> we need the slides after the presentation. I would like to introduce the next sp speaker. He's one of uh, actually my favorite people here in Houston. He's not only a great surgeon, he's a wonderful man, uh, Dr. Ross Rule. And uh, there is one issue with Dr. Rule. He has a very like, positive, strong family history of cardiac surgery. His father was um, a great surgeon here at the Baylor. Dr. Rule is a great surgeon. And now his son matched as a, an integrated program resident at Emory. So we are all excited for him. Dr. Okay. Rule will talk about minister not on AVR. Go ahead, Dr. Rule. Thank you so much, Kazim, and, and thank you, Mahesh and Kazim, for inviting me to, to speak. Great to see so many good friends, and now that we've, uh, now that uh, Kazim has gotten out in the open, my family genetic defect, uh, we're, we're ready to get on with it. I think it's a genetic defect on the Y chromosome, so maybe one of them will have a daughter. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about, mini, uh, about mini sternotomy, aortic valve replacement, and uh, no disclosures other than the fact that uh, I don't really call this a minimally invasive operation. I think any time we, we go on pump and, and open the sternum, it's hard to call that minimally invasive. Uh, maybe different invasive cardiac surgery, but we'll, um, we'll, I'm going to go through mostly uh, technical aspects and how to do the operation. We'll talk about that more in the, in the lab, but I wanted to kind of give, uh, give you a few tricks um, of this trade that I've learned along the way. And um, I don't have much data because there isn't a lot of data out there that's, uh, that's really um, pushing. But um, the benefits uh, we've talked, I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad to hear you're calling it the RAMT now because the, uh, I didn't like uh, doing a rat operation. The patients don't really like that too much. But um, the, the, MIS, the MIS AVR also may be going out of favor. Um, so uh, we keep the lower part of the sternum intact. And what, what I've really found over a couple of decades of doing this is that the tighter you close the sternum, the better uh, for, for any full sternotomy. And really the lower part of the sternum, when that's wiggling around, when patients cough, that's what really causes a lot of their pain. So I think uh, the less you spread the sternum at the beginning and the, and the lower, uh, the tighter you close the sternum at the end, uh, the better for pain control. We avoid the intercostal nerves. And being a uh, thoracic surgeon also in, in my past life, uh, I did a lot of thoracotomies and mini thoracotomies and, and tiny thoracotomies. And even uh, having one patient that came two years later complaining of chronic pain from the Chitwood clamp site, uh, I think any time you go near the intercostal nerves, it can be uh, chronically painful. Uh, we have no muscle division uh, with a mini sternotomy. Central cannulation, I think this is the key, is that uh, this operation can be done exactly the way we do it with a full sternotomy. There's really, the learning curve is on getting in there and, uh, and there's not a lot that we do differently. Uh, um, the, there's no groin incision, uh, any, as you know, any seroma, any, any hematoma, anything uh, femoral vein uh, obstruction, anything like that can be tough to the few patients that have it. And direct access to the aorta and valve if I get into trouble um, in, with this operation, I'm right there looking at everything. I can put my finger on it. It's, it's kind of a nice, uh, nice exit strategy. And, uh, and simple conversion to a sternotomy, you go a few more inches down the sternum and you're, and you're in there. So these are the extra, uh, th these are the different types of instruments that I use, and we'll talk about this in the lab a little bit. 
Um, I like to have the small defibrillator paddles in, but anyone who's done this knows that it's very hard to get the, even the baby defibrillator paddles on, so I always have patients. We always have the R2 pads on. We have the external pads uh, ready to go for defibrillation. defibrillation. I think the, uh, the Aztec retractor or any of these small uh, retractors are really nice to use for this. Um, and uh, I use a flat venous cannula just to get it out of the way, but you can really use any, any arterial or venous cannula. Um, the barracuda clamp is my favorite uh, instrument, and when the song barracuda comes on, we always have to put that in my hand. Um, regular perfusion tubing, and the PA sump is no longer available. It's very easy to do this operation with. You can, you can easily get a right superior pulmonary vein uh, sump in for the left atrium and, and left ventricle, or you can just drop a 13 French uh, sump directly through the valve, and that's very simple. So uh, this is my, my favorite clamp. It's my pacifier. Um, no longer available. So the, the operation itself is, is quite uh, simple. We, we find the inner spaces. It's very important to be midline, and it's very important to, uh, to direct, correctly find your inner spaces. Uh, as you know, the first inner space is quite wide. Um, sometimes when you look at the sternum, when you've gone to the fourth inner space, uh, it feels like you, you haven't really saved much, but you're leaving the lower sternum intact. I use about an eight and a half centimeter incision. I base it over the um, fourth inner space, and we usually go through the third or fourth inner space, depending on the size of the patient and what needs to be done. I like to use a hemostat to find the, uh, the inner space there, right on the edge of the sternum. And uh, again, I can't overemphasize the importance of being midline. It's, it's really important to closing when you're, when you're midline going in. Uh, I like to tilt the saw a little bit and, and start sawing and straighten it out and then go straight down. And then when I get to the point where I'm gonna curve it off, uh, it's very simple just to turn the pneumatic saw just a little bit and, and just give it kind of a J incision. You don't have to go all the way into the inner space, and I find if you stop just short of the inner space, you, uh, we've always preserved the mammary vessels. I've, I've fortunately not had to uh, crash in to get the mammary vessels at all. Um, it's somewhat hard to pry the sternum open to get the Aztec retractor in. Uh, I like to use a, uh, an Army Navy, just tilt it a little bit. You can get one blade in, uh, tilt it a little bit again, and slide the second blade in and that gives you a very simple approach. If you have f completely flat blades, that can work also. Uh, and then I like to slide the retractor up or down and do uh, get hemostasis on half of the sternum, slide the retractor the other way, and get hemostasis on the rest of the sternum. And it makes it very simple to expose everything very quickly and, uh, and get the bleeding to stop. It always looks like more blood in the chest because you have a small opening. And instead of bone wax, I just reconstitute a little bit of vanco powder with some saline. It's a nice way to get, um, to get the bone marrow to stop bleeding. Pericardial stays are absolutely critical to this operation. You can make it very, very easy. And this is how you make this operation almost identical to the, to the standard full sternotomy operation. The pericardial stays are, are really nice to get exposure. And I like to put the stays in uh, then take the retractor out and put the blades of the retractor back inside the pericardium. Um, even though you're already pulling the pericardium over with the stay sutures, this actually gets the epicardial uh, and the thymus fat out of your way. Uh, so you're not dragging fat globules into your field uh, with your suture loops. Uh, and this, this is really a nice way. And these, um, these retractors are very nice uh, to angle it and, and actually get the pericardium spread you can see this patient had chronic AFib and a large right atrium, and the right atrium kind of covers up the aortic root here. Uh, but you can get exposure to the entire aorta, and as you know from anatomy, you don't need to see the uh, RV anterior wall in order to do an aortic valve replacement. All you need is the aorta. Um, the nice thing about this is direct central cannulation in everybody. Nobody gets a groin incision. Um, and the uh, I do the purse strings the standard way. Uh, I put my aortic cannula directly in uh, across the pericardial reflection. Uh, you can use any aortic cannula you like. I like this one with a little vortex on it. And um, it's very simple to put your finger on the aorta. You don't need to use knot pushers. You don't need to use um, long peanuts or anything. And just the standard way of doing the aortic cannulation. 
again, uh, the things that you're going to get into trouble and need to uh, get more access, you really don't need much more access to this. Um, if, if you need to, you can get a real quick exposure. And here, this big right atrial appendage was really nice because it was right in the middle of my field. Very often you have to uh, pull up on the atrium a little bit more in order to get full uh, exposure, but you can cannulate the right atrium directly in the, in the anterior portion of the right atrial appendage, or you can actually put a, a partial clamp on the right atrial appendage and, and cannulate around the tip of the atrial appendage. Either way is very simple. I like the flat cannula because it keeps it out of my way a little bit more. Uh, and it, even with a third interspace incision and a much smaller skin incision, uh, you really don't have any obstruction. I use retrograde cardioplegia on everybody who has a coronary sinus. If, uh, if you're going to stop the heart and they have a coronary sinus, I usually put a retrograde catheter in it. Um, and this is very simple to do with this procedure. Uh, sometimes in patients who um, have a lower right atrium or they're uh, a little bit bigger heart, dilated a little more, I'll put them on pump first and, uh, and just put the cannula in on pump so you're, you're not up under the sternum. It's also sometimes easier to do the uh, retrograde from the right side of the table. Uh, but once you get the tip of the cannula in, you can usually uh, estimate where the, uh, where the uh, coronary sinus osteum is based on where your cannula is, and it just slides right in. We don't really even need uh, anesthesia to tell you where it is. Uh, aortic cross clamping, I used to use the Gumby clamp and just fold it over. I found that just the standard uh, aortic cross clamp is all we need. You can push the aorta over just a little bit and see it. And I use the standard anagrade. I use, I still, I'm probably old school, I still use uh, cold blood cardioplegia, anagrade and retrograde on, on all patients to get excellent cardiac um, protection. Now this is a key that I found that really works well. Uh, put a stitch down in the base of the pericardium, right on the inferior wall of the pericardium. Make sure you don't hit the liver with it. Uh, but you can use this stitch to pull the uh, venous cannula down and it pulls the right atrium away from your aortic root. Uh, I used to put the venous cannula in through the right-sided chest tube site, uh, but when I found this technique, I didn't have to open the right pleura anymore. Uh, and so this is really nice. You just put a stitch in the base of the pericardium uh, on the inferior wall of the pericardium, and when you tie this down, it gets the entire right atrium and the cannula and everything out of your way, so you can really see the aortic root uh, very easily. And again, the flat cannula makes it, makes it real nice. You can see you're looking right down the aortic root. I use a CO2 tubing and I, I, give, uh, I fill the space with CO2 on all the patients. The, um, making sure that when you sump the, uh, the ventricle or if, you, if you're sumping the ventricle or if, you're, uh, or if you have a PA sump, I always keep the blood fluid level just below the aortic valve uh, right over the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve to keep air out of the left atrium. And you can give anagrade cardioplegia selectively if you'd like, um, if you're having trouble with the rest. Um, but uh, it's very simple with this exposure. And then sizing the valve, uh, doing the, the actual valve operation is exactly the same as the standard operation um, ex with a full sternotomy, except that you have the sternum sort of overlying. So if you're right-handed, uh, the sternal edge is gonna be in your way a little bit. I use the uh, long shafted instruments so that the handle of the regular needle drivers is not in my f visual field. And you can see um, seating the valve is, is simple through this. You can, you can see all the angles. You can put all the stitches in the, sa the standard way. And you can either tie the knots um, if you have reasonable space between the aorta and the, and the sewing ring, um, or if you don't have a real badly calcified sinotubular junction, you can get your fingers right in there. I don't rely on knot pushers. I uh, don't need to use any other instruments. And then uh, if you do have a, a, a smaller aortic uh, a sinotubular junction or a calcified uh, aorta, you don't want to stick your fingers in there over and over. Uh, you can easily use uh, core knots. And on some of the less radio-opaque uh, valves, I will use core knots just to show the annulus a little better later on uh, if you ever need to do a tab or valve and valve. Uh, but as you can see, the operation is exactly the same as it is in the full sternotomy. The only difference is you can't see the right atrium, uh, the right ventricle, so you do rely on echo, and uh, you have to communicate with your anesthesiologist to know if the ventricle is distending or anything like that. Uh, standard closure with one running suture line of, of proline, um, 
and uh, you can see the CO2 uh, tubing there, so we, we do uh, use CO2 installation. And then at the end, things that are very important uh, that I learned along the way, always put your pacing wire in before you, op before you uh, take the cross clamp off. So here you can see we released the, uh, the suture in the, in the pericardium, and just with a gentle suction retraction, you can see the inferior wall of the RV uh, with the shafted instrument. You can easily put a pacing lead onto the RV. And then uh, once that's in, then you can take your cross clamp off. But I, I like to do this with, a, with the heart still clamped. And then passing the pacing wire out was a big challenge until I figured out a way to do it. And so I just make my chest tube site just below the xiphoid process. I use a hemostat to pop through the fascia and keep hugging the uh, subxiphoid plane with your hemostat. And if you develop the plane in a subxiphoid fashion, put your finger inside the chest to protect the heart, and you can use the barracuda clamp to get just under that uh, subxiphoid plane uh, through the fascia. Make sure you're, you're scraping the back wall of the sternum as you go in with the barracuda, and I actually poke through the pericardium just at the reflection of the inferior wall of the pericardium and the diaphragm. I, I usually grab my glove there to make sure that it doesn't slip off and I don't poke the barracuda clamp through the, you don't want the barracuda to bite the heart anywhere. And then you can just slide your pacing wire through, uh, make sure it doesn't go off to one side and slice as you go through, but you can slide your pacing wire through, uh, then you have a very easy exit of the pacing wire. I usually drop it through the subcutaneous tissue a little ways away from the uh, away from the chest tube site with a ground lead on the skin. And uh, through that same incision, go back in with the bar barracuda. You can, uh, again, make sure you're always hugging the sternum with the barracuda. You can feel it from the outside. Uh, make sure you're not in a subcutaneous plane. Make sure you're not going into the uh, uh, peritoneum. And always use your finger to pad the, the heart and then the uh, chest tube is very easy to pass. I found when I used to go through the right pleura to put the uh, right atrial cannula in, I had trouble when I put the chest tube in through that site. I had a few more pericardial effusions than I wanted, and I think it was because my chest tube was not placed in a dependent position. I think having the chest tube in the inferior part of the pericardium is important, and this makes it easy. Other adjuncts, adjunct procedures you can do through this uh, incision uh, now and now, you know, anybody with AFib, I like to put a, a, an atrial appendage clip on, and, um, and so this, this is very simple uh, with the Pro-V and the, and the new uh, devices. They're, they're very simple to put uh, a clip on the atrial appendage through this incision. It is nice to do it before you take the cross clamp off. Um, if you forget about it and take the cross clamp off, you can still see it and you can still get there pretty easily. Uh, but it's a whole lot easier when the when the heart's decompressed, and you can you want to make sure that you really orient the appendage well because it's usually redundant and folded over. Uh, but you can see here that um, once you orient it properly, it's a straight shot with this with this uh, device. It's very simple uh, to do that procedure. And then uh, aortic root replacements, aortic root enlargements are very simple. Uh, aortic root replacements, uh, replacing the whole ascending aorta up to the uh, distal ascending aorta is very simple through this. Um, I'm still doing arch replacements with a full sternotomy just because I like the exposure a little bit better uh, going up on the left side, uh, but you can do it. And if I was going to do an arch, I, I usually uh, would open, uh, I'd put my J on the left side. Makes it a little easier for exposure. You can actually lift that uh, edge of the left side of the sternum up and, and really get way up into the arch. So that's pretty simple. Um, so the cosmetic effect, I, I think, doesn't really make much of a difference to many patients. Um, I don't, I, I always, the patients always want to have safety first. And so I'm not so concerned with the cosmesis of it. I like the fact that the lower part of the sternum is left intact. I, I think that does help with stability and with return to uh, normal function quickly. Uh, but it also, it, 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 I think the things that help with pain are that the, you can't spread the sternum as wide. Uh, if you don't spread the sternum as wide, there's less uh, muscular pain, and the fact that you can get a good tight closure uh, is, is really important. So I, I believe there's a law of conservation of invasiveness in the universe, uh, that invasiveness uh, cannot be created nor destroyed. Uh, it's only moved from one place to another. 
And uh, I think this operation kind of goes against that universal law because you really don't add invasiveness anywhere to do this operation. You're not making a groin incision. You're still going on pump. Uh, you can still have the same arrest. Uh, the ischemic times and cross clamp times are the same because the operation is the same. Um, I derived this uh, from uh, one of my plastic surgery fellows when I was a resident. Uh, said there's a conservation of ugliness in the universe. And as plastic surgeons, we, we don't create or destroy ugliness. We move it from one place to another. <laughs> so um, this is my conservation of invasiveness with ismix. I apologize, but I, I think I'm an old school surgeon. I still think astronomy is not the end of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rood. That was really a great talk. Thank you so much. So with this, uh, with this version of REEV, we have introduced a new topic, which is uh, minimal invasive uh, pentad and root replacement. And uh, we, we cannot find better than Dr. Peter Knight, who pioneered this, uh, this operation to talk and to give us a talk on this. And then he will demonstrate it also on the lab. So we are pleased to have you, Dr. Knight, here. Thank and you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, allowing me to present this topic. There's basically three things I like to do in life. One is heart surgery. The other is to watch other people do heart surgery, so it's been a great two days. And the third one is water skiing. I didn't get any water skiing in, but the, the meeting's been really enjoyable so far. So I'm gonna talk about right anterior mini thoracotomy bentals. Um, I'm from uh, Rochester, New York, so I really have enjoyed the weather down here. It's still about 20 degrees up there. This is the uh, medical center in the foreground, our uh, undergraduate campus in the midground. Um, the Genesee River was flows from north, from south to north, actually heading up towards the city of Rochester. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. I would like to point out before I forget it that um, my research fellow is in the audience, Eric Nukimana, and uh, he and Roger Winkler helped me a lot with the video presentation and the slides. Eric is a third year general surgery resident in our program. He'll hopefully be in the fourth free pathway to being a cardiac surgeon in the next couple of years. So this is a how-to talk. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time trying to convince you to do minimally invasive bentals. Uh, I think everybody in the audience, by your mere presence here, believes in minimally invasive surgery. Um, so I'm gonna tell you how to get there, I hope, and in detail how to do this operation. So first of all, you gotta become an expert with right anterior mini thoracotomy exposure, and that takes some time have a robust mini AVR experience through a right anterior th thoracotomy approach, so I think that's the first step in it. You have to have done a lot of bentals through sternotomies or partial sternotomies and be comfortable with an endoscopic camera because the camera is really essential in much of this operation. So how did we get there? I did my first mini uh, AVR through a right anterior thoracotomy in uh, March of 2015, and prior to that, I vowed I would never do that operation because I was doing partial stenotomies like our previous speaker, and exactly what he said, same incision, half a sternotomy, central cannulation, the operation's done exactly the same, why would I do this? And then I had a patient come to me and say, this is what I want, and I decided, okay, we'll embark on it. And as I like to say, it's a small step from convert to zealot, and I have definitely made that step. So in May of 2016, 14 months later, we did our first mini bentel, and we got there by this 53 mini AVR cases during that period of time with gradually increasing degree of difficulty. We were doing peripheral cannulation on all the patients at the beginning, but now for all our mini AVRs, we do central aortic and uh, percutaneous venous cannulation. And then on May uh, 21st, we did our first the mini bentil. In between, we also worked in the cadaver lab, doing mini bentils in the cadaver lab. And uh, we've performed 41 cases. Well, actually, we're up to about, I think, 46 cases now. 41 cases via five centimeter right anterior mini thoracotomy. 40 were mini bentals. One was a mini ascending aorta. And as far as uh, patient selection, um, what I've learned basically is, first of all, you got to do healthy uh, patients who are younger. Why is that? Because you're going to have a longer cross clamp time and a longer circular rest time. No question about it. Ideal anatomy, as previous speakers have actually pointed to, first of all, avoid a calcified aorta because it's going to make the distal anastomosis uh, more difficult and therefore slower. And I know everybody in the audience through a sternotomy can do a hemi arch with a five minute uh, distal anastomosis circle rest time, but it's gonna be in the 20 plus minute time for, for, for this operation. 
Um, it's nice to have the order to the right of the midline, which is uh, almost always the case in this, this disease process anyway, so that's not a big deal, but as um, Dr. Kemp pointed out, the distance between the sternum and the aorta is essential. If it's more, less than two centimeters, it's going to be hard, and I definitely would not advise doing that early on. It's the anterior aspect of the distal anastomosis, actually, that's the hardest. I'm going to go through in detail, but quickly, the actual positioning steps, prep, etc. cetera. Uh, so, of course, the patient's supine, arms are at their side. We don't extend the arms. We have to, you have to have R2 pads on. And positioning those R2 pads is important because if they do fibrillate after coming off, after removing the cross clamp, you really want to have a reliable way to defibrillate people. Uh, I use cerebral oximetry in everybody, obviously transesophageal echo, a swan in everybody. I never use a double lumen tube for any of my minis, so not the mini A's and mini M's or the mini B's. Um, the prep is wide and the, uh, pre uh, and the draping is wide, and the reason for that is I want to be absolutely sure that I know where the second intercostal space is, and to do that I have the clavicle in the field. Uh, the, we are going to do a cut down for all the uh, bentals, uh, minimally basis, so that obviously you need the groin prepped as well. So the incision is in the second intercostal space, five centimeters or so, so it's a little bit bigger than the mini A. Mini A I'll usually do in, in four centimeters. For the mini A's, we'll, we'll spare the um, intercostal, the, the uh, the rib, but on a mini B, I, I always uh, um, uh, divide the, 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 the third rib. So enter the pleural space laterally to avoid the IMA. Place a wet 18 by 18 lap sponge in the pleural space so you don't hit the lung when you're doing any dissection, because keep in mind you haven't gotten on the heart-lung machine yet. Um, I like it, the IMA in all these cases, because we need pretty good e exposure. Disarticulate the third rib, as I said. I don't necessarily do that on a, on a mini A, but on the, on the bentals, I always do. Alexis and a, uh, a Miami Instruments uh, a retractor. First thing I do when I open the pleural space after I get the retractor in is identify the phrenic nerve and the aorta, so I know exactly where to put that uh, uh, pericardiotomy, dissect the mediastinal fat vertically, enter the pericardium at the level of the aria appendage, because where the aria appendage and the aorta come together, that's, there's almost always a potential space when you make a hole there, you don't hit the right atrium or the aorta. Then, of course, extend per, uh, pericardiotomy superiorly and inferiorly. Identify the, the uh, RPA. Simultaneously, someone's uh, doing a cut down on the femoral artery and femoral vein. Uh, and the echo, as, as previous speakers have talked about, the cannulation has to be done with echo guidance. The SVC has, uh, cannula has got to be in the SVC. Uh, this operation really can't be done if you have poor uh, venous drainage. As soon as I go on the heart-lung machine, I start the cooling because I circ arrest everybody. Um, the lung, the lung goes off. Don't forget to take the lap sponge out. Uh, we have a nice system for it. I announce it so the circulatory nurse knows it, puts it on the whiteboard with a check mark uh, when it comes out. I use a superior pulmonary vein sump in everybody because good exposure, good drainage for this operation is important because it's time consuming. And I'll show you with my results, the cross clamp times are long, the circ arrest times are long, and you don't want to have anything that's going to slow you down. So uh, having good drainage of the LV is nice. The camera goes in, the camera is essential in my opinion for a lot of stuff. Not all of it has to be done with the camera, but quality assurance and some of the, uh, of the uh, imaging can only be done with the camera. Uh, I put a, it, only for this operation, not for mini A's, I'll have a separate uh, weighted sump through a, a stab incision. You'll see in the video why that is. The, mo the order has to be mobilized from the uh, pulmonary artery, obviously, in, in all these cases, and I do that on pump but before we cross clamp. Antigrade cardioplegia goes where the aortotomy is going to go, so I put it in, take it out, and make the incision. I use um, adenosine in all my mini cases, so mini A's, mini M's, mini B's. I use adenosine first. That stops the heart right away. I love that because you don't have any ejection against your cross clamp, which I think can be dangerous sometimes. And I use um, a custodial, HDK which, um, in my experience, we've been able to extend this cross clamp time for over two hours, actually. I'm not crazy about over two hours, but we've done it. Uh, remove the cardioplegia cannula, make the aortotomy, transect the aorta, 
identify the left and right main coronary arteries. I transect the aorta right away so that we can then put stay sutures in the distal aorta and, and retract it out of the way. Keep in mind the, the working space there is very small. So the parts of, this, of, of, of the body that you're not operating on right away, you want to get out of the way so the parts that you're doing, that you are operating on, you can have better exposure. So we put uh, stay sutures and pull the aorta, the, uh, the cephalad aorta, aorta, very cephalad. On the commissures as well, so you gain exposure. Put more stay stitches in, as everybody's pointed out with this stuff. If you need more exposure, get more stay stitches. And then I, I'm, I keep on cooling. So while I'm cooling and waiting to get to a satisfactory temperature, I just do all the proximal stuff I can do. So first off is um, um, insert ventricular packing in the LV. Uh, on a calcific aortic stenosis patient because I like to be able to catch all the debris that falls down, remove the disease valve, debris the calcium, remove the sponge from the LV, irrigate as needed, create the buttons. Uh, when you hit the right temperature, and we monitor the BIS, but mainly I, I, I look for temperature when I get cold enough, Trendelenburg, and I go down to 50 cc's. I don't shut the pump off completely because if you do that, you evacuate a lot of blood from the descending thoracic aorta. This way, there's the, the, orders, the descending aorta is never completely evacuated, and that's where the sump comes in that I told you about before. That weighted sump goes into the descending thoracic aorta. So the clamp comes off, the weighted sump goes in. The aorta is resected, obviously. You resect it to the, uh, the uh, hemiarch usually, usually. The distal anastomosis is performed just the way you normally would with four prolings but with shafted instruments. After that's done, you de-air the uh, cerebral vessels arch and descending thoracic aorta, reapply the clamp. You try to get it as high as possible, again, so that you can get things out of your way. So now you're doing the proximal root part. You commence warming at that point, place the sutures through the annulus, you, uh, place them through the, the valve, secure them. I use coronauts on everybody. The coronary anastomoses are basically the same way you do it through an open case, but I think it's actually a little easier, especially the left main, because you're to the right of the aorta now, and you can see really well. The graft-to-graft -graft anastomosis, shut the uh, sump off while you're doing the graft-to-graft -graft so you can de-air. The CO2 is being insufflated, so really there isn't any air, because as you all know, uh, the incision is small. Your uh, uh, carbon dioxide is denser than air, so it settles down. Uh, so pretty much all the gas that's retained is going to be carbon dioxide, and it absorbs pretty quickly. And that's the, uh, the end of the case there. Complete closure happens with the you de-air, the you de -air come off. Make sure there's no air be or CO2 before you come off, and you can see that well with the TE, uh, and you're sumping while you fill the ventricle, and the sump's still in the, left, in the, in the LV. I don't use pacing wires. I don't use pacing wires for any of these cases, A, Bs, or, 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 or the Ms, unless they have a, a rhythm issue. And we published this, actually. There's a, if you don't have AV block at the time of closure, then in our experience, less than 2% of patients have required an urgent transvenous pacemaker. So I just don't put them in. I know it sounds crazy, and, and I thought it was crazy at the beginning, too, but it just stopped doing it. 224 Blakes, and they go in through the uh, um, uh, the port where the uh, sump was uh, and where the camera is, so there's not an, an additional incision. And they use a fiber wire to reapproximate the rib, inject marking, close the wound, fast track the patient. So the video the will patient show is the supine. Detail. He has a Swan Gans catheter, transesophageal echo probe. There are R2 pads placed on the chest for defibrillation. The incision is about four to five centimeters in the second intercostal space. I have this marked out so that you can see where the camera port is going to go. The groin is exposed, of course, because we will use femoral artery and femoral vein cannulation. Here we are making the incision, putting it in the camera port. The Alexis wound retractor and the Miami retractor are already in position. We use liberal use of stay sutures to gain exposure. Sometimes it's four or five, sometimes it's eight or 10. Before we go into the heart-lung machine, of course, we have to retract the lung, and there's a lap sponge in the pleural space. Once the heart-lung machine is instituted, we can shut the lungs off. Here we are cannulating the femoral artery and femoral vein. This is done with echo guidance so that we can be sure that the femoral venous cannula is well up into the SVC and the arterial access is intraluminal.
the echo image shows the venous cannula in the SVC. This is critical because without good venous drainage, exposure will be quite poor. Most of the time, we do not need retrograde cardioplegia, but I do point out that it is feasible in many cases to get retrograde in, again, with echo guidance. In the AI cases, if we can't get retrograde in, we'll use direct coronary osteoperfusion. I, I never use retrograde Pul anymore. Uh, I, I, just pulmonary vein sump perfusion. is placed routinely as well in the superior pulmonary vein on the right side. This uh, image shows you the placement of the first string suture. The pulmonary vein sump is placed into the left ventricle and at acceptable placement in the LV is confirmed by pulsatile return of blood from the sump cannula. The anti-grade cardioplegia cannula goes in about where the aortotomy is going to go. And then once we have cardiac arrest with two liters of custodial, the aorta is then transected. Here you can see the remaining portion of the ascending aorta is being resected up to the level of the innominate artery, doing a hemi-arch distal anastomosis. This is done with circulatory arrest. We always run the pump at around 50 cc's a minute so that the uh, descending thoracic aorta is not completely evacuated of blood. A sump is placed in the descending aorta to maintain a bloodless field. Once the aorta is resected, we mobilize the distal aorta at that level so that we can easily place the distal suture line. The suture line is placed with 4 proline and a beastal and then a graft to graft anastomosis at the end. With the use of the camera, this anastomosis is actually fairly easy. The posterior aspect of the anastomosis is straightforward. Sometimes the anterior aspect can be difficult if the sternum is very close to the aorta. Once the anastomosis is completed, we de-air the graft, the uh, ascending aorta, cerebral vessels, and uh, reapply the clamp. The cardiac bypass is then reestablished. Here we are fashioning the left main coronary button. The coronary anastomoses, in particular the left main button, are as in every ventil, a very critical part of the operation. So this dissection is done very carefully. Adequate mobilization of the left main. We're very careful at this stage not to injure the pulmonary artery. And of course, if there is an injury, it needs to be identified and repaired. is then created with two ethabon sutures. Here we're using pledgeted reinforced sutures. With all the mechanical valves, I'll use non-pledgeted sutures, and sometimes with the tissue valves, I'll use pledgeted, sometimes without. This is a magnet ease pericardial heart valve, which is installed in a Valsalva graft. The Valsalva graft size needs to be three millimeters greater than the valve size itself. This is probably a 25 valve and a 28 Valsalva graft. Here we're doing the left main coronary anastomosis, and again, I would caution you that this anastomosis has to be precise, as bleeding in this area can be difficult to control. Following the left main, then we will then do the right main coronary anastomosis. The coronary is tailored to the appropriate size, get into the graft and a piece of dacron removed, and the anastomosis then performed. I did tend to use bioglue on most of these anastomoses, just a few drops of it to ensure hemostasis at the needle holes. It's very important when these anastomoses are completed to inspect them from inside the graft and be sure that everything looks as good as you want it to be. If there's any spot that's potentially problematic, the time to fix it is right now and it's very easy to put sutures in while the graft is open. We're tailoring the Dacron segment for the appropriate length, and now we're going to look at the anastomosis and be sure that we're very happy with them. I usually probe them with a right angle clamp or a cystic to make sure there's no stenosis. 
Following this, we will complete the graft, the graft and anastomosis again with 4 proline. As we're completing this anastomosis, we will st shut the LV sump off, allowing the LV to fill with blood. I should mention that throughout the case, CO2 is being insufflated through the camera port, and that results in complete removal of the air. Here is the completed product from outside the chest, showing good hemostasis and the exposure of the graft-to-graft -graft suture line. The so our case series, we have, as I said, 41 patients. This is their demographics. They're pretty young, age 56. 34% were pure AS, 44% pure AI, and a mixed 22%. Uh, uh, comorbidities are as noted. Ejection fractions are all uh, pretty, uh, preserved. Ejection, ejection fraction is 60 percent. So this is the part where people have uh, acceptable criticism of this operation. The cardiopulmonary bypass time is long. It's 187 minutes. So I'm telling you the absolute God honest truth and not making up any stories here. It's 187 minutes of median time. Cross clamp time 142 minutes. Most of those are in a single dose of, of uh, HDK. Uh, the most long, uh, lengthiest of those have been, we redosed a little bit. Circa rest time averaged uh, 25 minutes, and we had uh, two patients that came back for delayed primary closure. The uh, spectrum of the valves, 26 onyx, 11 magna E's, three trifectas. I don't use trifectas anymore. I'm sure nobody else does either at this point. Um, as far as their post-operative results, this is where I think it shines. Uh, time to extubation, 9.8 hours. Initial ICU length of stay, 26 hours. Four people got readmitted to the ICU for various reasons, but our post-op uh, length of stay was uh, five days. Uh, we had one perioperative MI, no strokes, uh, two patients that returned to the OR for bleeding. There was a 30-day 30 30 readmission rate of uh, 5%, which was two patients. We had no uh, deaths at 30 days or in late follow-up. We had two conversions. One was early on. It was a median, I, I converted with a median sternotomy. This is a patient who returned to the operating room for bleeding. I was really worried about whether I would have uh, exposure for the bleeding. So this is probably in the first five cases or so, and I just did a sternotomy. And it turns out I could have done it through the thoracotomy because it was the lateral aspect of the graft-to-graft -graft anastomosis, but I was too chicken to do it. Uh, so next time I'll just go through the sternotomy, through the uh, thoracotomy incision. And then the, the other one was a mini-J, which was pretty electively done in the operating room. We were on pump but not clamped. I was mobilizing the aorta. I just couldn't get exposure because the aorta was really midline or just to the left of midline. And um, I could not get around the aorta and mobilize the aorta to the PA. So electively, we did a partial sternotomy down into the intercostal space and jaded over and gave us great exposure. Uh, 39 of the patients were discharged to home. That's 95%. Two went to a skilled nursing facility. Um, the mean follow-up was at 2.7 years. All the patients are alive at that point. We actually have more patients now, but we, have, we don't have any follow-up yet on them because it's only been in the last couple of months. And all, as I said, all patients are still alive. So in conclusion, I say, one, first, with careful and deliberate development, mini bentil can be done successfully and safely. Uh, I think it requires a robust pre-bentil uh, uh, experience. You have to have done a lot of bentils first and a lot of mixed experience, especially mini AVRs. Mini AVRs are, are, are the key. The setup is essentially the same. It's just the extent of the operation. And then, as I like to say, everything, uh, el just like everything else we do, there are really only two steps, myocardial protection and hemostasis. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Knight. Looking for uh, your station at the lab. It's very interesting. Next, I would like to welcome my uh, very, very good friend and mentor, uh, Moritz Weiler von Balmus, to give uh, some imaging consideration when you plan a big surgery. Moritz. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, join Peter in saying that it's really great to come and see other surgeons do their work. Uh, how do we switch to my laptop? Anybody?
video signal comes out through one port, not the other one. Mm. Which port? It's, yeah, it's the first one. Try the other side. So anyways, my talk was going to be on imaging and um, So my talk is going to be about imaging and incorporation of imaging into minimum invasive cardiac surgery. And I'll try to make up some time that we may have lost along the way with this kind of stuff. Have the USB stick. Uh, yeah, can you do Yeah. Do you have one? Uh -huh. Morris, do you want to do the same thing or like will it, Dr. Ramshindani? No. Uh, sure, you want to go. <laughs> yeah. For the sake of time. So, while we're sorting this, I think uh, we'll move ahead with the next talk. Mine's loaded back there, so if it doesn't work, then okay. we can still It's not doing it? Mm -hmm. Don't go away. I want you Don't to go help away. me. No, I want you to he help me here. So with a USB stick where he doesn't know what to look at. Exactly. Hold on. Now, so what do, what do I do here? Off? Put it on slideshow? Uh, that worked. Do we have Dr. Ramshandani talk there? That did something, didn't it? Slide. Yeah, you're good. There you go. Good? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay, well, um, what? Is that yours or mine? No, I just going to see something. Go ahead. If you leave your computer plugged in, I'll take you to Yeah, fine, fine, fine. Okay, um, well, while they're loading Moritz's talk on imaging, which I think is an important talk, um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about rapid deployment valves, which Bill Kent alluded to earlier. I do think it's, uh, it's an important technology uh, that uh, anybody who does minimally invasive aortic valve replacements should be familiar with for reasons that will become uh, more obvious uh, as you begin to use it. <clears throat> so there's basically two types of rapid deployment valves that are out there. Uh, the the uh, uh, what used to be Levanova, but which is now Corsim, a company that's uh, been formed to take over the valve division that used to be under Levanova, and the Edwards Intuity valve. Both of them have been shown in a in a in a number of papers to facilitate. Uh, the performance of minimally invasive cardiac procedures with low gradients, shorter cross clamp times, and they're well suited for small routes because even in the small sizes, these valves have got very low gradients because of the larger effective orifice area that they have. The Percival valve is a uh, uh, collapsible, self-expanding nitinol, which some of you may know stands for nickel titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory because it was designed using U.S. taxpayer money in the 1950s and the, uh, it, at, at DARPA and the original intent was they were looking for some kind of new metal alloy as a heat shield for intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, it never actually got applied to that. It turned out to be a very difficult material to work with and machine. And it wasn't until the late 80s that the technology, the manufacturing technology, came into play, which allowed them to use um, um, uh, nitinol for a variety of purposes. Um, 
So it's, uh, you basically collapse it. It's a traumatic insertion through the sinotubular junction. It's very easy to remove and reposition if you need to. Short learning curve, uh, really very easily learned, I think. The big issue with it, um, which takes, which is what most of the learning curve is about, is learning how to size it correctly. Because uh, as, you're, as I'll point out, um, when you're in between sizes with a Percival valve, you really want to undersize, which is not the instinct that we have as cardiac surgeons. You always want to put the larger size valve in. Uh, with the Intuity, uh, it's more conventional sizing, fast deployment. Uh, it's not collapsible. The view isn't as good when you deliver the Intuity valve down, in my view. Um, and so you have poor visibility around the valve. Um, and, uh, and you can't reposition it. Once it's in place, it's in place. This is sort of what it looks like. It's a blend of the uh, Sapien S3 valve with a Magna Ease valve seated on it. So the, the uh, delivery mechanism um, and the expanded skirt that occurs uh, lower down uh, to seat it in place is uh, derived from the Tavi uh, valve. It's not a valve that I have a lot of experience with. I did try it on a, I did try it early on. They're both good valves, uh, um, and uh, you'll find that, that you'll gravitate towards one or the other depending upon your personal preference, and mine, is, uh, mine has been for the uh, uh, Percival valve. Uh, this is guided down using uh, three sutures, uh, which are placed at the nadir of each sinus, and these sutures are not removed, they are tied down, so it's not a sutureless valve, strictly speaking, it's a rapid deployment valve, whereas the Percival valve is a sutureless valve. Uh, now, let's see if I can. This is a one and a half minute uh, video uh, from the Edwards website, which demonstrates you just excise the leaflets and you size it using a conventional sizer and mark the spots of the nadir so that you can put those sutures in that will be used to uh, guide the valve down into place. <clears throat> and then you secure it in place uh, with, uh, with uh, tourniquets. <clears throat> Use that to deliver the valve down, secure it with tourniquets, and then you uh, deploy the valve using this delivery mechanism to which it's attached and um, inflate it to uh, somewhere between four and five atmospheres. And then you take out the, uh, the uh, tourniquets, tie down the, uh, uh, the sutures, and, uh, and that's... Okay. The... Uh, uh, hemodynamic performance of this valve is excellent, um, and there's been a number of trials uh, which show that it's, that it's safe to implant with, uh, with good uh, durability. The Percival sutureless valve is increasingly being used for surgical aortic valve replacement, especially in mixed cases, and appropriate sizing remains a challenge. It's very, basically a question of altering your mindset to understand that you want to use the lower of the two sizes if you're in between sizes. And if you do that consistently and have faith in that, uh, you will be rewarded. If you, if you oversize it, you'll end up with a higher gradient because it actually crimps the valve and you end up with the leaflets uh, 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 compressed against each other, creating this so-called pinwheeling effect. And if you undersize it too much, you have the potential for a perivalvular leak. If you oversize it, also the increase of permanent, the, there's an increased rate of permanent pacemaker, which has been as high as 10, 12 percent in some studies. And in our hands, we've just submitted an abstract that was accepted at ISMIX, uh, is now down to less than, uh, 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 it's around 3 percent, which is comparable to surgical uh, sutured uh, aortic valves. There's little data available about the sizing of Percival, like correct sizing and oversizing, and we're actually working on using preoperative imaging to try to predict uh, what sort of size uh, you might need to use to bolster your confidence when you actually use the provided sizes intraoperatively, kind of like one, do, uh, one does for TAVI. 
So it's the design and features of a transcatheter heart valve, but it's implanted after debridement of the annulus. And here, again, you use three guiding sutures, just like you do with the um, uh, intuity valve. But the difference here is once the valve is down in place and deployed, you remove the guiding sutures so you don't have to tie anything in place, and it's held in place with, uh, with, uh, with radial force. This, uh, this is a, um, uh, uh, on a uh, pulse duplication uh, uh, bench model, it shows you that the valve has a, has a flexible uh, frame and it actually expands and collapses back with each cardiac cycle, uh, which theoretically reduces the risk of stress on the, uh, reduces the stress on the leaflets, uh, but also uh, makes it a very good valve for valve and valve because the expansion that occurs when you place a TAVI valve within it, if you have to, is circumferential. It doesn't fracture in one place. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this is the view you get from a right anterior thoracotomy, that talk that Bill Kent gave, such a nice talk. And it's really all you need to see. And um, uh, I'll show you a short video over here skip to the interesting part of the valve deployment, uh, you've, uh, you've already seen the steps that would take you to this point where you make your um, aortotomy. Excuse me, go back. And here we're sizing the valve um, and then the valve is selected um, and uh, passed on to the sterile field, and the scrub nurse will then collapse it on the back table. Um, it, th there's no crimping of the leaflets. It's just the frame which is collapsed. Uh, and it takes about two or three minutes to do this. Um, excuse me, I keep. And once it's been uh, handed over to you, there's three eyelets uh, on the valve, which are at uh, 120 degree spacing, and you pass the, each of the three sutures which you've placed in the nadir uh, uh, through these eyelets and use it to guide the valve down into place. Now, both of these valves are going to be demonstrated up in the lab, so I'm going to skip through this, and there are some technical points about implantation that I won't go into over here. Uh, uh, but will be pointed out in the lab upstairs. It's a very interesting technology. And there's the valve that's deployed, and uh, you check uh, to make sure that it's well seated, and the technique for doing that will be demonstrated upstairs. And then uh, 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 you would balloon this uh, to four atmospheres for 30 seconds, and while that's being done, warm saline will be placed on the frame to achieve maximal expansion because it's a nitinol valve. Now, the mean pressure gradients for this valve are really excellent. This is a paper that uh, uh, Matthias Glauber published a few years ago uh, with echo follow-up up to five years demonstrating consistently low gradients, even in the small size, as you can see over here, uh, uh, single-digit gradients. Um, excellent results uh, in the uh, European multicenter experience. Um, uh, this was um, uh, 731 patients followed up to five years, showing 0% structural valve deterioration. And this was even better, an 11-year follow-up that was presented at the AATS uh, in 2019, uh, showing um, um, uh, uh, no cases, well, four of 468 cases had endocarditis, and there was one patient, with excellent echo follow-up in this, in this cohort, there was one patient who had structural bowel deterioration. He was an 85-year-old lady who was quite frail, and she refused to have surgery. Um, this is a paper that Gilmanoff put out in 2014 showing that compared to sutured valves, these, the uh, pump time, clamp time, uh, post-op vent and the size of prosthesis difference was markedly significant with extremely impressive p-values. Um, and this was confirmed in a meta-analysis that was done uh, a couple of years later and published in the Journal of the American Heart Association. It's a very, very handy valve to use for combined uh, procedures because the time required to implant this valve after you've done a mitral or, or you've done a couple of bypasses is really short, and so it's a, you know, it's quite a relief to just drop it in and and uh, and move on to the completion of the case. 
As I pointed out before, uh, the valve is well suited for valve and valve procedures. And this chart was taken from Vinnie Bappert's uh, uh, app for valve and valve sizing. And he told me that his daughter, in fact, had designed the app when he was back in the UK. She was 18 years old at the time and she took it on as a summer project and it's now used by heart surgeons all over the world. But if you look at this, this app, you'll see that even the small size for Percival, uh, you can accommodate a 23 sapien or a 23 core valve. This is an example of an oversized valve uh, early in our experience and this patient had uh, 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 developed PVL and interestingly the PVL was not noted in the operating room but was picked up on post-op echo two days later. So the crimping of the valve that occurs may occur immediately but it can happen in a delayed fashion. And essentially what happens is if you oversize it, a circular valve gets pushed in and it becomes like a kidney-shaped orifice, and you then get leak uh, in that area there. So we treated that by basically doing a valve and valve using an S3, and it was an extremely effective fix. That's a happy patient. They all are instructed to smile. <clears throat> and the take-home points for Percival are it's good for AS. You do need some calcium. Uh, Theoretically, not in a bicuspid valve, but we have found that unless it's a SIVA zero, it's perfectly straightforward. Uh, you need to respect certain sizing criteria, which we'll talk about upstairs. I would advise not using it in the setting of an ascending aneurysm, but we've since changed that, and we've done a number of AVR ascendings uh, with this, so it's perfectly safe to do. The gradients are impressive, even in the small size valves, reduce cross, cross clamp times. And um, we'll talk again upstairs about where you need to position your aerototomy, um, et cetera. Uh, do not oversize. That's the, that's the mantra that we keep saying over and over for these valves. If you're between sizes, choose the smaller size. And what you want is trivial central AI, because you don't want the leaflets to be overlapping. And when you get that little trivial central AI, that's almost perfect sizing because it allows maximum valve expansion. And you can do valve and valve even in the smallest size. So the keys to success in minimally invasive cardiac surgery, which is just, these are just general points summarizing what other speakers have said to you, is that teamwork is very important. Everybody has a role that's crucial to a good outcome. Visualization is key. Um, and uh, you need to use a headlight camera or a thoracoscope so that the entire team is involved in the operation. Learn about appropriate cannulation strategies which have been pointed out to you. Uh, concentrate on myocardial preservation and do whatever you need to do to maintain good preservation. Uh, uh, be aware of and adopt new tools and technologies, and a lot of that stuff will be displayed up up in the lab today, so I would encourage you to take the time to look at all the uh, uh, tools and the technologies that various vendors are going to lay out for you. Spend time looking at them and, 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 and try to see what can help you and what you do. Training, we're not going to go into that. This is very difficult. I mean, we're making a, uh, uh, you know, an attempt over here to introduce you to it, and hopefully you will go on to adopt this in your practice. But most importantly is a culture of safety. Extremely important. Remember, patient safety always comes first. And if you have to convert, I would recommend that you convert early and you do it in the interest of patient safety. Then you will, you will not have bad outcomes. Um, all of the talks that are given at this meeting, um, in addition to being live streamed, as I pointed out yesterday, will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, Debakey Education, in about a week or so. They'll live forever over there. You can download them and review them at your leisure, which I think is a useful thing to do. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can get it. Garden roots. Can I get it back? This is my. I think it worked there. This is the Eris talk. So we're doing Q Morris next? Or? You're doing the imaging next, right? Uh, I can, or I can skip another talk and come back. I mean, the slides are ready then. Let's do the Eris talk.
I apologize, Moritz. No, that's good. All right, let's cease the moment. I think we're good. We're good. Hmm? This is not showing up there. This is. Uh, it was a moment ago. Iris, talk, please. Okay, so. So one of the things that we added also in this in this summit, and it's a very. In oh, it's good. Okay. Yes, no, maybe Easy. so. Right. Anyways, great. Yes, okay, good. So I was asked by Mahesh to give a talk on imaging and um, talk about how we can use imaging in minimal invasive cardiac surgery. And I think all of us use some, but maybe there are some ways we can do even more. These are my disclosures, mostly related to device trials. Um, so when, when we talk about imaging and cardiac surgery and minimal invasive cardiac surgery, it's mostly a data-free zone, I think, so it's fun. I, I can essentially make up this talk. Um, most of imaging isn't really developed for cardiac surgeons or cardiac surgery in mind, except for maybe a left heart cath. And all of us use some imaging modalities, but what I hope to show you is that it, we can maybe leverage more imaging modalities, newer imaging techniques, and really use what we already have at our disposal to maximize um, the use of it. And the two examples I'll be mostly talking about is ultrasound and then CTA, and I think you've already heard some about the CTA and using CTA. And the other point I'd like to make is, it's really great if you have a good team that does all that for you, but I think it's even better if you know how to do it yourself, at least sort of the basic principles. Mike Chu made a, a really good teaching point about mitral valve surgery yesterday. You, you don't go to the OR to find the pathology to fix. You go to the OR to fix the pathology that you know is there. And so, you know, I don't think that only applies to mitral valve surgery. I, th I think we have imaging technique available and we should use it. There's no reason why we wouldn't use all the information available. Steve Hoff earlier made a good point, and others have alluded to that as well, that it is a lot about getting there, getting there safely and coming back safely. Once you're there and do the surgery, it, it's gonna be the same thing you do with an open approach or through a sternotomy. And so I think it's about creating this familiarity of getting there safely, coming back. This is familiar to a lot of people probably in the audience. It's home to me. So, you know, getting there is really what minimal invasive cardiac surgery is all about. Once you're there, um, you're going to be doing the exact same thing as you would in an open case. Why is it important to get good at imaging? This is a double lumen tube. Um, like most everyone else here, I've stopped using double lumen tubes. But I think if you use a double lumen tube, you need to know how to work it. You don't want to rely on the anesthesiologist to get it in the right position and adjust it if it doesn't work. I think if you rely on this as part of your procedure, you know how to, you have to know how to work it. And when I did thoracic surgery, we all had to place our own double lumen tubes and make sure it's in the right place. So I, I think a good reason to get really good at imaging is because you don't want to necessarily rely on other people doing it. This is sort of what comes to mind for me when we talk about modern cardiac surgery, I think, especially in the structural valve space, but also in the aortic space that there is rapid expansion of technology, new techniques. And so while it used to be good enough, I think, to be a really, really good surgeon, I think you have to develop these transcatheter techniques. You have to be facile with wires. And as part of that, I think you have to be really good at using imaging, translating imaging, and leveraging it. This is the same message over again. I think in open heart surgery, we all use some imaging. If you go all the way over to the spectrum of transcatheter therapies, you entirely rely on imaging. 
And I see minimal invasive cardiac surgery somewhere in between, and there's no reason why we, again, wouldn't use what we already have available. So um, three things I quickly want to talk about. I'll spend most of the time about cardiac CTA because that's where I currently get most of the information from, then ultrasound and how I use it, and TE. And I, I will just say here, TE is something that most cardiac surgeons never learn to do. At some point in my training, I decided I want to get certified for TE. The reason was mostly that I wanted to be a good mitral valve surgeon and really understand the mitral valve. Where I use it most today is when it's the anesthesia fellow at the head of the bed that can't get the view. It's extremely powerful if you stand there and tell them you have to advance the probe counterclock, you have to adjust your angle. Or you can just stand there and wait for the anesthesia attending that is somewhere in the hospital drinking coffee and may come. And you'll just be waiting there for a really long time. So th there's a lot of good reasons why, again, you know, trust but verify, but you know, rely on people. We all need help from other people, but if you know how to do the basics of it, it gets you a long way. So cardiac uh, CTA is, again, where I will spend most of the time, and uh, I think without further ado, I'll just delve into it. I'll also say if we talk about imaging and how to use imaging, it, there's sort of two components as I see it. One is to learn the imaging modality, and you have to learn the basic technology of it, the acquisition, the you have to be able to assess the quality so you know whether it's actually uh, useful or not, and you can use the imaging. And so, you know, this is from a CT scan. You know, most will know what the kilovolts are. How many do know what that is? That's the pitch, you know. You, you, you want to know what the pitch means for a CT scan and why it's important. You want to look at the heart rate. You want to know what that means, 26% in a cardiac phase. These seem all like things that we don't necessarily pay attention to. We all know how to read a CT scan. But once you start understanding all this stuff, you have a much better understanding and you can do much more with your imaging technology. So uh, CT, what, what do I use it for? Well, I do routine uh, percutaneous femoral cannulation. I've done that for a couple of years now. My first choice is Amanta. Second choice is ProGlide. If that doesn't work, I'll go to a cut down. Um, I look at alternative cannulation strategy if femoral cannulation is not an option. I'll do essentially access planning, certainly for more complex cases, not for the routine cases, mitral, tricuspid, aortics, but if there's some specific pathology and I have a case at the end of this, um, I think it's very helpful to use the CT scan to sort of get an understanding where you need to go. Again, create that familiarity. Um, you can evaluate MAC and all that stuff, so you know what you get yourself into, assess the transcatheter valve, you need to do a valve in MAC. Um, you can look at the aorta, you know where it's safe to cross clamp if you can't do that. So you should never end up, in 2022, should never end up doing a case and sort of worried about whether you can cross clamp or not, knowing that you couldn't cross clamp. I also use the information available um, for the analysts and sizing an aortic valve, for example. I know before I go to the OR if I'm going to do a root enlargement, what valve I'm going to be putting in, how big the valve's going to be, and I'll show you how I do that quickly. Same for coronaries, you know, I, I use the onyx valve a lot, but it has a higher profile. I like the valve. I, I know if the onyx valve is going to work based on the coronary height. I don't have to guess in the OR. So again, you know, cannulation, my go-to is uh, the Manta. It's a really great device. It's a really great device, it works well, it's a one-stop shot, it's very quick. You go in, put the cannulas in, and then you just close it. It's essentially a large angioseal device. It's not a great tool to use when you have really obese patients. And more importantly, it's not a great tool to use when you have a lot of calcium in the back wall because your foot plate can be hooked in the back wall and then you get into trouble. So you need to be fast out with your ultrasound probe. You have to be really good at where you stick. You have to be able to assess whether you can use the Manta device in that specific patient. Some of that comes from the CT scan, but again, a part, another part of it is really coming from the intraoperative imaging with ultrasound. Um, same with ProGlide, you know, works well if you have a reasonable vessel size, you can do percutaneous femoral cannulation. It works with some calcium, not a ton. If all that doesn't work, you know, you go to a cut down. But all that, you, you don't find out in the OR. You, you can make all these decisions ahead of time based on imaging. Um, this is sort of a standard view that I like to use. I, I just get a quick, um, re, you know, recon. As you can see, straight shot, no calcium. This lends itself very well for a percutaneous uh, cannulation. 
Uh, you can do the exact measurements of the sizes, so you can decide if, if it's going to be big enough for a manta. You can decide which canal size you can use or not. So you, you get all the information you need to choose your canal size that you can do max. You can use your um, which closure device you're going to be using. Um, again, more of the same. Uh, as I said, you know, all these things you can decide ahead of time based on the imaging. This is Again, same stuff, just in a different uh, software. Most hospitals have the software available. Everybody that has a TAVR program will have one software available. The first version was with Singovia. This is Freemencio. They all do the same. And the interest of time, I think I'm just going to go through a little bit quicker through this. So same for aortic valve. You know, you can recon the aortic valve. You know. You essentially know when you're going to go in there and replace your valve where your calcium is going to sit. Um, all these things are, are helpful pieces of information that you don't need when you've done like 100 or 200 of them. But when you start out, this can be really helpful information. As I said, I can tell you ahead of time which valve size I'm going to be implanting um, based on the measurements I do. So, you know, sometimes it has to change, of course. You have to do the intraoperative management and all, uh, measurements and all that. But for the most part, you know what you get into. And I think it creates that familiarity. So, you know, there's not a much guesswork involved. Uh, this was, I think, just to demonstrate again, you know, I measured this, the coronary heights. That's something we routinely do for TAVR valves. If I know I'm going to use a, a mechanical valve, my go to is the onyx. If I'm worried about the coronary height, then, you know, I know that ahead of time. Um, what else can be, uh, what else can CT imaging be used for? I think it's a really great tool for people that haven't done many cases. You can essentially simulate what you're going to be looking at. You can turn the patient to the side, position supinely. You know, you can look down. You know, you can look which interspace you're going to be using. Do you want to be up here and have a straighter shot? Or are you going to be lower down here? What happens if you go more lateral with your incision? What are you going to be looking at? SVC, right atrium. So all these things, you know, where's your right coronary located? There's a lot of information you can glance from that. Again, that's not Im so important anymore once you've done a couple of hundred of those. But when you start out, this is really, again, creating familiarity and helps you a lot to understand where things are at. So the other uh, thing I quickly wanted to talk about is ultrasound. Um, I've started using PEX-1 and SAP blocks and all uh, patients, and if you're wondering when I made my comment about the TE probe and the uh, double lumen tube, you're probably really wondering about our anesthesia department now. But it's very quick, you know, it's, it's very quick, and I'll tell you that this has made a much bigger difference uh, for my patients and the pain they experience than going from a, a five centimeter incision to a three centimeter incision. It really makes all the difference. Um, it's a good way to, to, to get familiar with the ultrasound using the ultrasound. And then again, the same thing, if you, if you do percutaneous cannulation, you have to be really good with the ultrasound. You need to know where you stick. You need to have the CT scan memorized, know where your landmarks are and where you're going to go with this. So this is sort of my quick um, imaging tour for, for most of my mixed cases. I reviewed a CT uh, for cannulation technique and site, the closure device I'm going to be using, the valve size, and whether I need to do a root enlargement. Then intraoperatively, I use the ultrasound to do my blocks first, and then I do the percutaneous cannulation, get everything ready to go on. Then I do the surgery, uh, which is the fun part. And then in the end, I use um, imaging and ultrasound specifically to, to make sure that my access state is clean and that I have good flow in the SFA and profunda. So what are good uses for, for, for imaging? Well, as I said, you know, I think one is mapping for comfort, creating this familiarity. It's a great teaching tool for people that are just learning how to do stuff. The other one is um, a case I'm going to show you uh, about localizing uh, where you need to go and, and sort of help that for mapping and find real estate when the real estate is difficult. And then maybe sometimes you use the imaging and decide to do something totally different altogether. So this was a lady that was sent to me by another surgeon uh, who was incidentally found to have a lipoma flacking in the LV. And so if you look at this uh, CMR image, it's right underneath the anterior mitral valve. And so uh, by show of hands, who would go through the mitral valve to get to this? 
Okay, who would go through the aortic valve? Me. So, so two surgeons would go through the mitral and two would go through the aortic and everybody else would not do it? <laughs> Leave it there. Yeah, okay. So, you know, it's very appealing, right? I, I think it seems like a straight shot and that's because of the reconstruction, but you don't really know how that sits. If you look on the other hand on this side, you, you seem like you see it coming into view there and it seems like you would have to look around the corner. So it seems like a dumb idea going through the aortic valve. Now, if I show you this, do you still want to go through the mitral doing minimal invasively? Um, pretty difficult, you know, lady has la really large breast implants that wrap around essentially <laughs> the entire chest. And then in addition, she had bilateral tram flaps. So, you know, you're really limited in the spot you can go in the taxis. So good use for imaging, you know. Uh, pull it up, mark it, um, and then what you can do is you can just draw a line, you know. So the target is right there, and now on that angio view, you, you can already kind of tell it's going to be a straight shot coming down uh, from the aortic valve. And so that's what I ended up doing, you know, a small incision and then do it totally endoscopically, just uh, drive the camera uh, carefully across the aortic valve leaflets. And I'm an extremely patient surgeon, as you can tell. They, I give them a lot of time to make the camera adjustments. But um, as you'll see, bingo, right there, right? It's exactly where you expected it. So, you know, I think, again, not absolutely necessary, but why won't you use the information you already have? Um, another case, you know, 53-year-old hypertension, three thoracotomies for pneumonia 30 years ago, completion pneumonectomy. BMI of 40, what are you going to do, TAVR or SAVR? So here's the CT scan. Who wants to go to the OR with this and replace the aortic valve? Sam is sort of, yeah, mm. with the robot? Yeah, the, I mean, the heart is just baked over to this side. You know, long discussion. I decided to look at this, do some recon, see where we're going with this, plan the incision. And this is real time speed, of course. So, percutaneous femoral cannulation, flux, incision mapping, five centimeter incision, mini thoracotomy, extubated in OR, home in three days. So, not an easy case, no question. Um, would never do this without imaging. So, again, I think. Imaging can be a really powerful thing. That's her going home on day three. Um, but we have to learn how to use the imaging and really utilize it. Thank you. Moritz, I think we made the right choice when we push you to give this talk. <laughs> Thank you. So the last talk is, is really an important talk and we introduced it for the first time and it's, it's an important topic in, in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. I think we, we have invited Dr. Chaturji here to give us uh, his um, thoughts and experience about ERAS in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. It's a very exciting talk and uh, I really, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to it and to hear it. I uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Ramchandani and the uh, organizers. I have the enviable position of separating the attendees from lunch right now. So my name is Shubha Chatterjee. I'm a board certified cardiovascular surgeon and critical care intensivist. Um, and I will talk about enhanced recovery after surgery and how it can uh, potentially help our practice uh, with respect to minimally invasive cardiac surgery. So first of all, what is ERAS? So enhanced recovery focuses on the patient and tries to guide them through the entire perioperative journey. That's preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. And tries to do uh, evidence-based protocols to return these patients back to their normal activities at the earliest possibilities. ERAS is based on the foundation of the aggregation of marginal gains, which means that very small incremental improvements across a number of different aspects of care can lead to sustained improvement. Conversely, small slips in multiple places can lead to declines in care as well. 
Guidelines were published by the Society about two years ago. It's one of the most uh, popular uh, papers that are out there in the domain of cardiac surgery. And it really focuses on different aspects. So I would posit to you that there's technical intervention that we've heard uh, over the last day and a half here. And then there's adaptive intervention. We'll talk about what these mean. So here for the last day and a half, outstanding surgeons throughout the world have basically shown how these incisions can basically duplicated with equivalent, if not better results with these incisions. So in order to do that, as surgeons, what we have to do is there's a technical intervention. So you developed a minimally invasive procedure. And the way you practice that is with developing a checklist and protocols and in the operating room best practices and you're measuring outcomes. And that's how you're successful as a minimally invasive cardiac surgeon. In the preoperative and the ICU phases, there's adaptive interventions that occur. This is much more multidisciplinary. This is, it requires patient engagement. It's much more teamwork driven in many ways and it's quality centric as well as adaptive. And this is where ERAS focuses together. So why ERAS? What are the complications that we see really with cardiac surgery? On the left, you can see we're all very familiar with these sort of outcomes. And on the right are other outcomes which are also measured, which are also a problem to the patient as well. And I think this slide is really representative, and this is both survey results, and this is, I think, sort of over the last 20 years what I've sort of understood. Really, as surgeons, when we track outcomes, the first thing we really look at is death. Then we worry about stroke, then we worry about other things like renal and respiratory failure, and then lower on the priority are low risk complications that are various that exist. When you talk to patients, most patients fear stroke first more than death. But what's interesting is that in survey after survey, cardiac, orthopedic, et cetera, the problems that patients complain about is their fear of pain, their fear of nausea and vomiting, much higher than the other STS metrics that we may track. And so this really focuses on not just STS metrics to try to improve our results, but using ERAS to talk to patients about what they may experience to be able to improve those outcomes. I think this is an illustrative slide. This is a phase of care mortality analysis. This, the bigger uh, numbers in red come from a Michigan analysis of 50,000 patients. The smaller study focuses on low risk patients in Brazil uh, with about just under 3,000 patients. And what you'll see here is they track where does mortality really occur? And I think the important thing to understand is that the f source of mortality in cardiac surgery about a third of the time actually occurs in the operating room, which means that about two thirds of the time, the source of mortality, the primary driver, occurred either preoperatively or postoperatively, and that really re behooves us to focus on the entire aspect. This is a detailed slide. This includes a lot of ERAS metrics through all three phases of care. I'm gonna do a little bit of a tour de force and pick and choose a couple of items selectively for that. But these are various elements that all really target various interventions uh, for patient benefit. And here's the component. This is sort of what we use uh, as well. This basically tracks various preoperative in of components, intraoperative components, and postoperative components. To develop an ERAS protocol, you need a physician champion who's a surgeon. You need an intensivist. You need anesthesia. You need nurses. You need multidisciplinary care for, to, in order to get buy-in. Now, let's focus on the preoperative aspect uh, specifically, and we'll talk about a, a few more detailed breakdown with required to that. Now, are there gonna be barriers along the way? There certainly can be barriers. In each institution, you have to respect the local culture and, and how that works. There are surgeon-specific, physician-specific, anesthesia-specific barriers and reluctance. There are patient barriers, and there's also system-wide things. But with, collectively, with data and with experience, these things can be overcome to be able to improve it. And once you implement protocols, these need to be sustained. These need to be, have a continuous mechanism of feedback to be able to continue to build and refine on how the process works. 
This is something that we looked at really over the COVID experience, which really created a unique opportunity because in COVID, now you had patients with elective valve surgery who couldn't get surgery in a week or so as they normally would. Now these people had to wait three, four, six weeks sometimes be able to do that. And there are experiences that we had to understand. This is probably a bad choice right before lunch, but the important thing here with when it comes to ERAS is, is the ERAS protocol, is this something that you, you need to do all of it? Is it an all or, non, all or nothing phenomena? Or can you, like a cafeteria and a buffet, pick and choose selected items? That continues to evolve and we'll have more data as that goes. So I would highlight certain interventions that I think probably in various phases can have some meaningful impact. At Baylor, we've uh, worked very closely with Dr. Ken Liao, who's just recently celebrated his 300th robotic heart surgery. And this is really where we're really illustrating the minimally invasive platform with ERAS. So from a preoperative phase, we really look at two things. One is prehab and the other is nutrition. So why does nutrition matter? So this is pretty, uh, I, I think, a, a, a way to look at this. It's a three-strike model. You have patients who are vulnerable, they're frail, they're malnutrition, they're anemic, they undergo the stress of surgery, and then something else happens, and then you have a bad outcome. So what you try to do here is you take patients, and I'll look at here as the standard of care. So that dotted x-axis is sort of when they're likely to have the complications. You have a patient who's frail, who's anemic, and they undergo the normal stress of surgery, they drop below the x-axis, and they're vulnerable to complications. So what you try then is you try to do the concept of prehabilitation. You try to get them stronger in various aspects to raise their threshold so when they drop below, they don't reach the threshold with the higher risk of complications. So with respect to nutrition, there are a couple of different ways that we can use this to be able to focus on this. So this is not a surprise. Patients who are malnutrition are gonna be at high risk of, of, of complications. That's not a surprise there. What we try to do then is we've implemented something called the Nutrix score. So we do try to screen patients who are at high risk of malnutrition. And this is sort of, it, it helps to develop, especially in valve cases where they tend to be more elective. And what do we do with this information? So we modeled this a little bit with the Duke group. We're still, to be honest, still evolving with this. The Duke group has, is much more further advanced, but patients who are malnutrition are actually being referred for higher immuno, uh, so immunonutrition recommendations and for higher protein in intake for somewhere between one to, two, uh, one to two weeks of being able to optimize them at a little bit higher level before they go on to surgery. There's a randomized trial that we're gonna be a part of which is gonna look at uh, what this can do in cardiac surgery with respect to outcomes. So, we're, so that's important. And you really need to measure, uh, measure these things to identify those patients who may be more vulnerable. Now, does it make a difference? So probably preoperative nutrition has been shown. This is in some cardiac cases, uh, as well as some orthopedic cases, uh, for fewer infectious complications with a little bit of a benefit in length of stay. So small difference there. Not really data yet that shows that there's been a mortality difference. How about frailty? Frailty is very common in cardiac surgery. You can see the wide prevalence of various aspects of frailty. And often it's frailty that really will decide whether patients are eligible for transcatheter therapies, minimally invasive therapies. And this is sort of how cardiologists, when they look at frail patients and if they see an expected surgical outcomes, they may or may not refer patients to transcatheter therapies up front. No surprise here. Frail patients are at higher risk of bad outcomes with cardiac surgery. The odds ratio for mortality, probably somewhere between two to two and a half times higher. Now, the real question then we have to ask ourselves is, um, can we do better uh, by correcting this. So first of all, can you identify frailty? And so this isn't hard. I think the TAVR experience has really helped us with being able to identify those patients who are frail and different risk source exists that can help us guide us there. But really the question then is, can we unfrail these patients? Can we defrail some of these patients? That's really the question that we're trying to ask. So what about exercise? 
So can you recommend exercise for patients before cardiac surgery and expect to see a benefit? So this has been looked at, and there is a benefit to showing lower ICU length of stay and some improved postoperative physical function. So the question then becomes, are there patients who may benefit, perhaps some frail patients who may benefit from a period of prehabilitation? We're starting to look into that in terms of recommending that for certain patients. So really, I think the approach with the new prehab is by alleviating patient anxiety and stress. And I'm gonna to get to this when it comes to pain uh, and, and, and post-operative nausea and vomiting. But if we can work on whether it's anemia and nutrition and frailty and exercise, can we improve them at a prehab level so that they're a better surgical candidate regardless of the patient? Now, there's a lot of collaboration that requires occurs in the ICU. As we all know, the OR is different. The OR has a clear captain. The ICU can sometimes have different, you know, different people that are involved. And as a surgeon, you spend less time in the ICU collectively. So where it's critical that there's effective collaboration within the ICU amongst all the different teams that are involved. So when you look at intraoperative measures, what can we do to look at Postoperative nausea and vomiting, and then pain. So there are different risk factors that occur with postoperative nausea and vomiting, but I would behoove that anesthesiologists look at this, but it's also important, I think, that surgeons look at this. This is the one thing that I learned as I started to do more critical care. Patients are kind of ashamed to talk to their surgeons about post-op nausea and vomiting. They don't wanna bother the surgeons and as surgeons, we don't really hear about post-op nausea and vomiting because it's something that the nurses deal with or the ICU deals with. But there are surveys that are out there that 75% of bad press gainy reviews in cardiac surgery are directly related to excessive post-op nausea and vomiting. So even though you may not see it today, it's showing up later on. So there are, what are the strategies for post-op nausea and vomiting? So this just basically shows different medications that are available. I just highlight this here, knowing that there are strategies besides just giving compensine at the first drop of the hat. This requires good collaboration between surgeon, intensivist, and nurse to be able to take care of that. How about pain? So, well, this is a, a group of minimally invasive, you know, leading experts. So, you know, one of the major benefits of minimally invasive surgery is that pain's out of the question or post-op nausea and vomiting are out of the question. This is an interesting study which shows that this problem is germane for all fields. This came out of the Mayo Clinic, about 125 robotic mitral valve cases. You'll see here that two-thirds of the patients complained of severe post-operative nausea and vomiting, and 75% of patients compared of severe pain. This is a minimally invasive robotic group. What was helpful? So the things that helped these patients a little bit was um, sternal blocks helped with respect to that and getting some methadone ahead of time uh, helped in terms of that. The point that I wanna emphasize here is that pain and post-op nausea and vomiting are things that patients complain of. Now, what can we do different? So there's medication things, but I would submit to you that part of it is our preoperative counseling of what patients can expect. We should not promise patients a pain-free experience. The goal, is, the goal is manageable pain, and then we also have to counsel them, listen, it's very common to have post-operative nausea and vomiting, and we will treat that. In fact, what I would submit to you is that there's a lot of data that shows that early carbohydrate loading, you don't have to be NPO eight hours, a carb loading ahead of time can actually have a significant reduction with regards to post-op nausea and vomiting. So what are, about pain with respect to that? Pain is bad, we know that. Opioids are bad too, and we know that too, and those are all listed here. Our role is to balance pain and opioids to make it beneficial for the patients, but not undermine them and undermine society as a whole. Why is this relevant? About a third of the public blames doctors for the, post, for the opioid crisis. In fact, what's interesting, and this is a study we looked at too, is that persistent opioid use, which means using opioids more than 90 days after surgery, occurs in about five to 8% of all cardiac cases without a significant, there's mixed data about whether minimally invasive is better, but when they look at it in terms of persistent opioid use, it's a significant problem that's out there. And the biggest determinant of who is most likely to develop postoperative opioid use 
is the number of opioids that are written for at the time of discharge. So if you use opioids, make it a conscious effort right before discharge, give a smaller amount. I remember as an intern being taught, you know, give these people 100 of Percocets so they never have to call the office again. We were part of the problem. Now it's our turn to sort of recorrect that. What are multimodal strategies? There are a bunch of different things that are listed here, but I submit to you what's really helped for us, you know, with regards to uh, not just medications, has been regional anesthesia. And, and I think the, the previous speaker looked at some of the regional blocks. Um, the, our anesthesiologists are doing that. We have about a 90% rate of using one of these blocks in terms of that, and it's really facilitated some of our ex earlier extubation. So, Delirium screening. Delirium screening is really important to be able to watch and to be able to measure. And what it really does is it facilitates earlier extubation. Because what we can see here, we're all trying to get people extubated within six hours. But if you don't get people extubated within 12 hours, your incidence of delirium really skyrockets. And that's where you start to see more and more worse outcomes in terms of that. So what are things that can be done to be able to do that? Multimodal is going to be helpful, as well as better communication. Communication. And increasingly, there's more and more attention uh, to ex extubating people sooner and sooner, including in the OR. Our robotic cases, about 30, about a third of our robotic cases are now extubated in the operating room. I have colleagues at Johns Hopkins who are extubating 80% of their primary, uh, primary cases in the operating room. So it's certainly something that can facilitate without really a difference in reintubation that's noticed. Finally, I'm going to conclude with kidney injury. So kidney injury is sort of the bane of a lot of existence. You know, the prevalence of AKI, you can see here, uh, is, is relatively common, uh, unfortunately. But and clearly, it's bad, right? Short-term survival is worse with AKI. Long-term survival is worse with AKI. So what can we do? This is a colleague, uh, Dan Engelman from Bay State. What they've developed and we're implementing in our own way is Nephrocheck and the use of urinary biomarkers. And the key with this is you can clearly see a reduction in uh, AKI development. You need a good team to be able to, to, be able to facilitate that to be able to work with that. And that's where you can utilize prevention bundles. So if you have uh, urinary biomarkers that are positive, uh, these are patients who better fit for a little bit longer inotropic therapy, having a higher cardiac index, not aggressive diuresis in the first 24 hours, avoiding nephrotoxin, some of the basic things that are there, but it's really a conscious effort to be able to do that. When we see our urinary biomarkers, those are people that we leave the PA catheter in a little bit longer rather than taking it out first thing in the morning. So in summary, uh, this is just a little bit of a brief sample of, of areas that enhanced recovery is involved. And I would behoove really, I think the take home message again is this, is that you guys are outstanding surgeons who've really uh, pushed this field in, in outstanding ways. I used to work very closely with Joe Lamellis when he was here in Houston. But recognize that about two thirds of your mortality is not in your direct control in the operating room. It's in your indirect control, either preoperatively or postoperatively, and those are areas that really the, the concept of ERAS and team building are, are things that uh, are necessary to, to move the field forward. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive talk. So Mo, for the sake of time, uh, we're not gonna have a panel discussion but maybe we can allow one or two questions for the last speaker in case you have something about ERAS. All right, so I think we'll move forward. But before we move forward, I have a special request from all of you to make. We will go ahead and take a group picture downstairs. So I request everyone to just get out of the room now and we'll head down to the stairs. It's the same picture as I showed you. The faculty will be in the front and the attendees and the organizer will be in the stair and behind them downstairs. So we'll do that first and then we'll head to lunch. And let's be like, let's try to make it because Dr. Ramchandani wanted to cancel the group photo and I insisted to do it. So we're gonna take two pictures. The first will be everybody, uh, all the attendees and the faculty and then we'll ask the attendees to you know, step aside and we'll take a faculty picture. And then I would ask you to have lunch after that uh, and we'll go up to the lab. We're running a little bit behind, but uh, uh, we'll make it work.